Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shabbat Shalom. Good to be together as we come into our Master's presence. And for those who will watch this recording later or in, in a couple of days to come, because we can't be physically online with everybody today due to various fiber issues. <laughs> but we are with our Master and we're here and we continue to celebrate His goodness over us. And today's Torah portion is a wonderful portion that reminds us of our set apartness that we are to be pursuing and throwing away all the junk of the rubbish that we were brought up in, in error. Mm. And so we, we continue to look at great examples in Scripture today of what to, what to do and what not to do mm. so that we can learn from that. Okay, so we're reading from Vaikra chapter 9. We're going through to 11, um, end of 11. So it's 9-11 today. Yeah. <laughs> 911, emergency. 9-1-1. Okay, so it's an emergency that we need to hear what's in the Torah portion today. <laughs> okay, so who's reading? Patrick. Yes. Okay, Pat, you can go. And on the eighth day it came to be that Moshe called Ahara and his sons and, and, and the elders of Israel. And he said to Ahara, Take for yourselves a young bull as a sin offering and a ram as an ascending offering, a perfect one, and bring them before Yahweh, and speak to the children of Israel, saying, Take a male goat as a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both a year old, perfect ones, as an ascending offering, and the bull and the ram as peace offerings, to slaughter before Yahweh, and a grain offering mixed with oil. For today Yahweh shall appear to you. And they, and they took what Moshe commanded before the tent of appointment, and all the congreg- congregation drew near and stood before Yahweh. And <coughs> Moshe said, This is the word which Yahweh commanded you to do, so that the esteem of Yahweh appears to you. And Moshe said to Aaron, Go to the slaughter place and prepare your sin offering and your ascending offering, and make atonement for yourself and for the people, and make the offering of the people and make atonement for them, as Yahweh has commanded. So Aaron came near to the slaughter place and slew the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. And the sons of Aaron brought the blood to him, and he dipped his finger in the blood and put it on the horns of the slaughter place and poured the blood at the base of the slaughter place. And the fat and the kidneys and the appendage on the liver of the sin offering, he burnt on the slaughter place as Yahweh had commanded Moshe. And the flesh and the skin he burnt with fire outside the camp. And he drew the ascending offering, and he slew the ascending offering, and the sons of Aharon presented to him the blood, which he sprinkled on the slaughter place all around. And they presented the ascending offering to him with his with his pieces and its its head, and burned them on the slaughter place. And he washed the entrails and the the legs and burned them with, with the ascending offering on the slaughter place. And he brought the people's offering and, and took the goat, which was a sin offering for the people, and slew it and made it, and made it an offering like the first one. And he brought the ascending offering and made it according to the right ruling. He also brought the grain offering and filled his hand with it and burnt it on the slaughter place besides the ascending offering of the morning. And he slew the bull and the ram as a slaughtering of peace offerings which were for the people. And Aharon's sons presented to him the blood which he which he sprinkled on the slaughter place all around. And the fat from the, the bull and, and the ram and the fat tail and the covering and the kidneys and the appendage on the liver. And they placed the fat on the, the breast and burned the fat on the slaughter place. But the breast and the right thigh Aharon waved as a wave offering before Yahweh as Moshe had commanded Aaron then lifted up his hands towards the people and blessed them and came down from making the sin offering and the sending offering and the peace offering. 
And Moshe and Aharon went into the tent of appointment and came out and blessed the people. And the esteem of Yahweh appeared to all the people. And the fire came out from before Yahweh and consumed the ascending offering and the fat on the slaughter place. And all the people saw and cried aloud and fell on their faces. <coughs> Okay, so this week's Torah portion is called Shemini, which is eighth, because we know it starts off, and on the eighth day, um, it came to be that Moshe called Aaron and his sons. Now it's the eighth day, because it's the eighth day after the seven days that had just previously <coughs> happened that we looked at last week, you know. Mm -hmm. So on, on the, as we see from this chapter, um, it was now time for Aaron and his sons to step up and do what was commanded. And what was set apart to do. In the, in the preceding chapter, we see how Moshe had done all the necessary sacrifices, set apart the, uh, uh, the dwelling place and everything else in order to set everything apart, as well as Aharon and his sons. And now that they, in effect, have been set apart for service and everything's set up, they were now able to go and do, on the eighth day, their appointed service that they were now equipped and set apart to do. They had been in the tabernacle for seven days, as part of the process of being set apart and a period of cleansing being set apart. And now they were equipped and ready as a priesthood to perform the duties as required. And so the wonderful thing that we can draw from this is, a, is what we have in our master. Yeshua Messiah came and walked this earth and he showed us how we are to live. And even Yochanan says in Yochanan Aleph that, you know, he who claims to live in him ought to walk even as he walked. Because he came to give the example. It's just as Moshe was told and commanded to do everything, showed Aharon and his sons, this is what you do. Now on the eighth day when everything was prepared and ready and they were cleansed, now you can do what you've seen me do according to the commands that I was commanded to do. So it's a process, you know. And so Moshe is, we know, a metaphor or a picture of the Torah. And so what we see here, it teaches us to instruct and walk in righteousness. And so Moshe is, in many ways, a reflection of Messiah, who is the living embodiment of the Torah, the instructions and commands on how to live set-apart lives and present our bodies as a living sacrifice, our reasonable worship before the Master, you know, called out as a royal set-apart priesthood, a chosen people, a treasured possession. And so we all know that there's an eighth, there's no eighth day of the week, okay? And so this number in itself carries great insight for us in Scripture and teaching us valuable lessons. There is an eighth day in type every week after the Shabbat because it, and it's the first day of the week, but it's the eighth, but it teaches us a valuable lesson. On We know we go one to seven, one to seven, one to seven as a clear witness of the one to seven cycle we see in the weeks, in the counting from uh, um, Matzot to Shavuot, and we see in the millennial reign a clear picture of the renewal that will take place on the eighth millennium, so the eighth day, so to speak, because with Yahweh, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. So what we see here is that this is a picture of how we are to walk continually in Messiah, that as we see that the kingdom of Yahweh is made up of set apart responsible servants who are always at his immediate call for service you know the eighth day symbolizes in scripture a number of things for us we see that it was the eighth day that the male children from Abraham to the seed messiah was to be circumcised on the eighth day as a sign of the covenant that was given to Avram. A firstborn animal was taken from its mother on the eighth day and given to, to Yahweh because the firstborn of the flock belonged to Yahweh. We also take note that a leper was also to be cleansed on the eighth day as we see instructed in Vaikra chapter 14. And one of the biggest eighth day things that we can think of in Scripture, which we're about to experience in a month or so's time, is the eighth day of Sukkot, known as the Shemini, eighth Atzeret, you know, typically also understood as the last great day. Because in a sense, it's the last great day of the cycle of the feast for that calendar year, and it shadow pictures 
the last great day before entering into a renewal of our master, when he comes again at the end of the millennial reign, at the end of the seventh day, when the books are opened and everyone is judged and the renewal comes, the renewal of the heavens and the earth. Mm. Now, Shemini 8 means eighth, and Atzeret actually means a set-apart assembling together or a solemn assembly, because that's when every eye will see and every tongue will confess that Yahweh is our saviour. You know, and so we'll see this will be a complete gathering of all. Now, some will be judged to death and others will go into the renewal to be with our master forever. You know, and so the eighth day of Sukkot is when our master was in the flesh. It was on the eighth day of Sukkot. We see him saying the following words, which we recorded in Yochanan 7. It says in verse 37 to 38, And on the last day, the great day of the festival, Yehoshua stood, out, stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me, and let him who believes in me drink. As the scripture said, out of his innermost shall flow rivers of living water. So how do we know it was the eighth day of Sukkot? Because you go a few verses back, and it says, And the festival of the Yehudim was near the festival of Sukkot. So the last great day of Sukkot. I mean, it's simple maths. You know, if you read, if you read normal, normally as people should read, you will figure out by the time you get to that verse that what day is this? You'll know what day it is. Okay, mm -hmm. but some people somehow miss it. And so the Shemini Atzeret is a, is a celebration of new beginnings because in type, in a cycle, when we come to Sukkot, by the time we've come to Sukkot, we've come from Matzot through um, um, having Pesach through Matzot, counted to Shavuot, you know, looked forward to Yom Teruah, which we are looking forward to now. And at Yom Teruah, we remember that we married, which Shavuot presents for us. And at Shavuot, we reminded that we were slaves in Mitzrayim. Then we go and we come before our master on Yom Kippur after the awakening blast of Yom Teruah. And we have this day of afflicting our beings because we realize that it's all about what our master has done for us to put to death the things of the flesh so that we can serve him in spirit and truth. And then with great expectation on Yom Kippur, we have this, the flesh is no more. Let the Spirit actually come and guide us and give us strength to do all. And we await for our master to come out of the chamber to fetch us and take us to be with him for the wedding feast and betrothal period of that wedding week. And at the end of the wedding week, on the eighth day, there's this wonderful gathering again, a celebration on type when we go year to year of now looking again. You know, now we know when our master comes, he will be the one that will take us. If we die before he comes, we'll be raised first. Those who are in Messiah and those who are alive will then also be taken up, caught with him in the air, as we see in Thessalonians. And he will take us to Yerushalayim. You don't need to make your own way to Yerushalayim as a taught one of the master. He will take us there. So when we come to the end of Sukkot and he hasn't taken us there yet, there was a common saying for many centuries of at the end of Sukkot, people would say, when they're saying goodbye to everybody, they say, next year in Yerushalayim. Because it didn't happen this year. You know? And so we understand this expectation that the eighth brings as well. You know? And so the priests did not start their service to Yahweh until the eighth day after a period of seven days of cleansing, as we see from the last Torah portion. The, you know? And so anyone also who had any infectious skin diseases or any bodily just discharge was unclean for seven days and would be separated from the camp and only re-enter the camp on the eighth day after their status changed through a cleansing that would take place. From the, so we, I hope you see this prophetic shadow picture of what eighth symbolizes for us in Scripture as we're looking at this Torah portion. You know? And so what we see is, as we know, even in the millennial reign of our master, there's still work to be done. Because the nations that do not obey will not get rain, etc., etc. But once our master's work is complete, once Satan is completely destroyed after being let loose at the end of the seventh day to try and lead some astray, which he will, you know, and then our master destroys the devil and the beast and all those worshipping the beast and those will be now judged before. And if you're not found in the book of life, you will be... Uh, um, thrown into the lake of fire, that is the second death, and then the renewed heavens and the renewed earth came, comes. And that's what Yochanan was given in the vision of the revelation of Messiah. And at that revelation, on the eighth day of the revelation of the renewal, Yeshua stands up and says, the one who overcomes will be my son and I'll be a father to him. So on the renewal, on the eighth day, so to speak, 
It will be the complete revelation, that, again, the fullness of the completion of the revelation that a son that was born unto us, he is the everlasting father. You know? And so as we continue each week, as, as I was saying, we, we, you know, when we come today on the Shabbat, the seventh day of the week, and we learn and we get fed by our master in his presence together as a body, we go on the eighth day, so to speak, to begin our week, the renewal, and, and take that renewal of our minds and, be, and walk out that week with fear and trembling, guarding ourselves with the renewal until we come again to seventh and come together and get refreshed and get equipped to go out and face another week in a renewal, a recovery of breath so that we can keep serving our master. You know? And so we have to, one of the things that we learn from the concept of one to seven, one to seven, one to seven in, in type of eighth, but it's the one, is that we have to grow from week to week. Feast to feast, cycle to cycle, year to year. We should be a people that are growing in set apartness. Chazon, after the revelation was given to Yochanan, he was told to go and declare these words, not to add or take away from it, because anyone who adds or takes away from it will receive every curse that's written in the book. But go and tell people and basically tell them, he who is filthy, let him be more filthy. And he who is set apart, be more set apart. So we should be pursuing. We sang a song there that about pursuing his presence. you know. And we are to be pursuing set apartness, for without which we will not see Elohim. In other words, we will not be accepted by him. you know. And so we should not find ourselves in a position of shrinking back, slipping back, or falling back into the captivity of traditions and doctrines of man that we were brought up in. Be it about birthday celebrations, be it about false feasts, be it about whatever the world has taught us how to shape ourselves, we shouldn't be shrinking back to those things. We should be pressing forward in who we are in the renewal of our minds through the spirit of Elohim and his truth. Amen? And press on toward the goal, that is Messiah, according to his Torah that he teaches us every single week as a bride together. Individually, we meditate on the Torah day and night, but we come together as a bride for that refreshing recovery of breath in our master's presence as a set-apart gathering to gain momentum in our ability to be walking out our deliverance with fear and trembling before his face. You know, And so what we learn each week on Shabbat through his word it's expected for us to go and perform the set-apart standard that we learn each week from the eighth day, the first day of the week, and keep going, and not procrastinate about our responsibility of serving as a priesthood. And so we, we understand very clear that this is a wonderful picture, and what was done on the first day is what will be done on the eighth Kind of, kind of thing, you know. This is a picture of the spiral of eternity that we're looking forward to with great expectation. Moshe did it the first time as an example, and he bore the burden that time, and now the priests were to do it themselves. Our master came, and he took our burdens upon himself, and he says, take my yoke, it's easy, my burden, it's light. Now, having seen the witness of the work of our master in completion, of which the shadow picture of the Levitical priesthood was set up to do as a picture of Messiah, now in Messiah, having come and cleansed all for us, we ought to not procrastinate, but we should now guard to do, because the Torah trains us to walk as Messiah walked. The priests, as we look at this, they had to offer exactly as Moshe offered, you know, and it had to come from them this time, you know. And so what Moshe brought was sufficient for seven days, but it would not see them through to the eighth day. On the eighth day, it was their responsibility to now take up the role of doing this, and it teaches us a valuable lesson. Our master came to complete a work of deliverance for us through him dying of himself and being raised and exalted above everything, seated in the heavens. But that isn't where our responsibility stops. As some think, well, he did it all for me. I don't need to do anything. Now that he's done that and given us example of being a living sacrifice or literally dying to self, we now take that example and we, as Philippians say, ought to have the mind of Messiah. Not taking the esteem of Elohim as something to be grasped, but we realize, just as he came to serve, we too ought to be servants in our master's presence as we serve correctly according to the standard 
of his word. We are to become doers of the word and not hearers only. And in verses 3 to 6, we see Moshe tells Aharon to instruct Israel what must be brought as offerings. And again, we see a community being involved in taking place where it makes sure that what is taking place is done with the work of everybody, the whole community, you know. And they were told that Yahweh would appear to them that day. You know, and so they had to have had great expectation and excitement. Having watched Moshe do all these proceedings for seven days and seeing the priests set apart in the tabernacle and everything going on, and now calling Aharon and his sons to now officiate the service themselves now. I mean, this was speed training, seven days. You better learn it quick. Teach us a valuable lesson. We shouldn't be procrastinating in our ability to know what the word is saying so that we can skillfully handle the truth knowing how to rightly divide and the set up and, and make a clear distinction between the set apart and the profane, the clean and the unclean. And that's why we read also in this Torah portion where it comes fittingly in uh, Vaikra with chapter 11 about what we eat, because it all, it's all about service. And if we can't even get our diet right, according to Yahweh's word, how will we get living out obedience right? You know? And so... There, there was great excitement here, and there was obviously anticipation and expectation. And so they all stood, they drew near and they stood before Yahweh. And this picture of drawing near and standing before Yahweh, we're told in Yochanan to cleanse, draw near to Elohim, he'll, he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hearts, you double-minded. Purify or cleanse your heart, cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify mm -hmm. your hearts. Or cleanse the hearts, you double-minded. Weep, mourn and wail, and humble yourselves before him, and he will lift you up. And so we need to understand the bronze laver teaches us the process of having our hands washed, our works, making sure when we're drawing near to Yahweh, we've looked at all the korban, what causes us to draw near. Now the blood of Messiah has given us the ability to draw near. We don't come with dirty works to serve him. We make sure our works are in accordance to that which he's given as a standard of cleansing by which he came and walked this earth in complete obedience to the Torah of Yahweh as a faithful son. You know, Aaron performed everything that was required according to the instructions of Moshe. And in type, we see our master when he was in the flesh. He says in Yochanan 8, He who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. So here we see again a powerful picture that Messiah in the flesh of man came as a man to simply submit to the instructions from above. And so we see a clear picture in Yochanan 6, verse 37 to 40. It says, All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I shall by no means cast out. Because I have come down out of the heaven, not to do my own desire, but the desire of him who sent me. This is the desire of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me I should not lose of it, but should raise it in the last day. And this is the desire of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him should possess everlasting life, and I shall raise him up in the last, in the, in the last day. Now, that's the last day before the renewal. So here's a, a kind of clear picture again of when our master comes in the last day of this week of creation, so to speak, in the millennial sense, he will raise up those that are in him that will enter into the renewal. Verse 6 highlights for us a wonderful lesson. And that is that when we, we guard to do everything that our master has commanded us to do, then we have the assurance of the esteem or the weight of the presence of Elohim appearing to us. We're going to look a little bit more when we look at chapter 10. But verse 7 to 21 gives us a clear account of the obedience of Aharon and his sons doing everything that Yahweh had commanded them through Moshe. And they had presented the ascending offerings, they presented the sin offerings, the grain offering, the peace offering, as Moshe had commanded. Everything they did according to the command. Again, it wasn't, oh, we saw you do it, let's try do it another way. No, that's not what they did in this chapter, you know. And what we see being recorded and documented for us in Vayikra 9 is that Aharon and his sons did everything they were commanded to do by correctly bringing the offerings that they were commanded to bring according to the strict commands for each offering. There was no deviation from the obedience 
to the literal commands that they were given. And this teaches us a valuable lesson that we just can't assume to do things our own way. When the word says, this is how you do it, you know, when we've been commanded how we are to live set-apart lives, give our lives as a daily living offering, that is our reasonable worship that Shaul writes in Romans 12, any departure from clear obedience to the commands of Elohim will render our attempt at drawing near to him as defiled and unacceptable and abominable before his face. Then it no longer becomes Yahweh's appointed times, it becomes yours because it's an orchestration of your own Things. That's why Yahweh says to Israel, I hate your new moons and your festivals and your gatherings. Why? Because they weren't doing it Yahweh's way. Then it's not Yahweh's anymore. You know? The Hebrew word that's translated as prepare in verse 7 when it says here, and Moshe go, said to Aharon, go to the slaughter place, prepare your sin offering is asa, which is to do. And we know from asa we get ma'ase, which is the doings or the acts. The book of Acts is all about the doings of the set-apart ones, the apostles, the emissaries. It's about a record of the obedience of the, the sent ones of our master. Because the Hebrew word for uh, apostle, apostello, means sent one. You know, And so we learn from that pattern, just as our master has commissioned all of us to go and make taught ones of the nations, we all must follow the patterns by having our doings according to the word you know we are to become as i said doers of the word and not hearers only and when we do the word everything according to the way yahweh has commanded us through moshe it's a command it's not a suggestion it's not a request when you enter into covenant remember aharon and his sons had entered into covenant they had said yes this isn't the nations that don't want to know yahweh when you say yes to yahweh you have now committed to being obedient according to everything that he instructs you to do. And so it's not a suggestion or request that comes from Yahweh to us as children of the Most High. It is commands that ought to be obeyed. Today there are so many who claim that they are believers, yet they lay aside the commands of Elohim. They've cast his commands behind him. They've set his words behind their back. You know? And as if it's not important, it's not necessary. We don't need to know this. And this sadly reveals their lack of love for Elohim. When people say, but where's the love? Oh, you just got to love. What standard is your love in your mind versus Yahweh's clear instruction in the word of what love for him entails? Yochanan Aleph tells us this is the love for Elohim, that we guard his commands and his commands are not heavy. In other words, it's not hard. <laughs> You know, we often talk about when people say, oh, you, you, you're too strict or it's strict. Strictness is, is, how can I say, it's a perception of the one not wanting to do what's required. Because if you simply do, then you'll find it's not hard. It actually is beneficial to do what's required. But when you resist, then it becomes hard to do and your viewpoint is, that's too strict. I don't want to do it. So when anybody says to you that you're too strict, <clears throat> don't take offense to it. <laughs> See it as their inability to submit and obey. That's really what it is. And representing childlike um, tendencies of not wanting to know the boundaries or wanting to learn the boundaries, so to speak. Now, the Greek word for commands is entole. Entole means an injunction, a command, a commandment. It speaks of a prescribed rule in accordance to that thing which needs to be done. In other words, there's a task at hand. Here's exactly how you do the task. That's an entole. Okay, or entole. And ethically, it's used in Greek, Greek to, to relate to the commands of Elohim as given through the Torah. We have to understand that. Now, as many other words that we've seen too, like there's only one Greek word for law, which is nomos, which sometimes confuses a lot of things in the mindset of people. And what nomos represents in the Septuagint is a varying amount of words in Hebrew. The same thing for entole or commands. Now, entole or commands or injunctions is used 187 times in the Greek translation of the Tanakh. And of those times, it's used to translate three words in particular in, of Hebrew. One is mitzvah, which is a commandment. 
The one is pikud, which is precepts or statutes or regulations, and the other is a chuka, which is ordinances or customs or manners or prescribed fixed statutes. So what we see, even in the Greek mindset, it, refer, it, it, it reaffirms for us what Yochanan was teaching us about love for Elohim and obeying the commands. For love for Elohim obeys to God the commands, the precepts, the ordinances, the statutes of Elohim spotlessly and blamelessly as we express our zealous love for him. When we say, no, we don't need to do this, we don't need to do that, no, it's too strict, you're being too strict there, we're saying we don't love Elohim. That's actually what we're saying by our actions of refusal to do what's commanded. Remember, any of the nations, don't, they refuse, they don't want to do anything because they haven't entered into covenant. This is about relationship. When you're in a relationship with Yahweh, you have a responsibility. Yahweh upholds his side of the partnership or relationship. And so too are we required to do that too. And so we've looked at all the offerings, but one of the things that we see after all these offerings, Aharon did everything that Moshe commanded. And after he had done that, he lifted his hands toward the people and he blessed them. What an awesome moment. Because when you guard to do Yahweh's commands the way he commands it, it's a blessing. It's not a curse. That's what the false teachings of corruption in the hall has done for centuries. Teaching that when you obey this Torah, you know, we're no longer under the curse. You know, that's what they kind of think. The Torah is not a curse. The curse of the Torah is is, well, not just death, it will lead to death, but the, the curse of the Torah is as a result of disobedience to the Torah. The Torah is not the curse. The curse is a result of not obeying the Torah. And the blessing is a result of obeying the Torah. That's why now everything was done, can you see the pattern? Everything was done perfectly. Now in Bar 6, at the end of chapter 6 of Bar Numbers, we see how Yahweh instructed Moshe how Aharon was to bless the people. When he said, Yahweh bless you and guard you, Yahweh make his face shine upon you and show favor to you, Yahweh lift up his face upon you and give you shalom. So I don't know if that's the exact words that he used chronologically at this day, at this point, because we see chronologically in Bimitbar, he was instructed, that's how you bless them. But the mere fact is, Aharon's high priest lifted his hands, representing everything that I've done is according to the works that you've commanded. It's set apart hands, lifted to Yahweh in obedience. And now, as high priest, the blessing can come on the congregation. So when our master came to only do that which the Father commanded, he could lift up his work, be exalted and ascend into the heavens and bless us as his assembly. And have his blessing of shalom and favor and loving commitment upon us, you know. And so when we understand the joy of walking in our master's presence and having his presence upon us, we understand what it means when he comes to bless us. You know, the concept of blessing in Hebrew to barach, it also comes from the root word to kneel down or to bend or to stoop down. Because it's a picture of a father coming down on his knee, or basically bending the knee to come eye to eye with his son and bless him. And that's a picture of what our master did when he humbled himself. He came from on high and he came to bow himself in submission to the things of the flesh, but not be corrupted by the flesh in order to bring the blessing to us face to face and then be exalted and lift us up with him. In the heavenlies. This is something that we have to understand in the pattern of the Levitical priesthood and its service of what we have in Messiah. Knowing therefore that we can be accepted by him as a beloved because we obey. But the warning in this Torah portion, as we'll see from the next chapter, is when you deviate even in the slightest, your, that blessing can be far removed from you and result in death. You know? In verse 23, Moshe, Moshe and Aharon go into the tent of appointment. After, you know, he'd lifted his hands, he'd blessed the people, Aharon, and then he came down from making the offerings, and he goes with Moshe into the tent of appointment. And this, again, is a wonderful picture of the powerful work of Messiah, who was lifted up for our sin, who came down, humbled himself as a servant, giving us the gift of life as a blessing for us, because without him, we were under the curse. We were, we, it's, it's appointed for all men to die once, but if you don't receive the gift of life, you will face the second death. Because only those who are in him 
will have part in the first resurrection. So we understand the blessing that he came, and when we see that he was the one that exalted on high is the name that's above every name. You know, And so in Philippians, as I mentioned earlier, from chapter 2, verse 5 to 11, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Messiah, Yahushua, who being in the form of Elohim, did not regard equality with Elohim to something to, a matter to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and came to be in the likeness of men. And having been found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, death even of a state. Elohim, therefore, has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Yahushua Messiah, every knee should bow, and of those in the heaven and of those in the earth and of those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Yahushua Messiah is master to the esteem of Elohim the Father. And every tongue will confess that Yahushua Messiah is Maria. You know, in the Aramaic text, Maria, Master Yahweh, it gives us highlight and insight you know, before the Greek text, understanding what was being taught here, that every knee will eventually confess that this one who came in the flesh is our master and savior. Every knee will, confess. Every knee will bow <laughs> and every tongue will confess. You know, and so after, you know, with Moshe and Aaron going into the tent of meeting and coming out, it's a picture of Messiah, the living Torah and high priest who ascended the heavenly tabernacle, but we have the blessed expectation of his soon return coming out which we know will take place on Yom Kippur when he takes off his priestly robes the service and intercession will be done and he will put on his kingly robes and not coming as a humble servant on a donkey this time but coming riding in the esteem of a king on his horse the word of Yahweh and so fire came out from Yahweh after everything was done and it consumed the offering which means Yahweh accepted the offering just as when it was consumed on Mount Carmel, when Eliyahu and ba Baal prophets had their showdown, you know, mm -hmm. and Yahweh accepted the offering of Eliyahu by fire. And then we see the judgment of Yahweh coming on the Baal prophets who were slaughtered. So we see a, a powerful picture at this point when the acceptance of Yahweh was seen by all, the fire of Yahweh consuming the offerings on the slaughter place. The people cried out and they worshipped in great reverence, falling before Yahweh in great reverence and awe of who he is. Picture the scene for a moment. You know, I, I sometimes think we read through these things, but can you imagine what it must have been like to see this fire coming down and taking this offering in a, in a split second, consuming, you know? And the people cried aloud, and the Hebrew word for cried aloud is ranan, which means to overcome, to cry, to shout for joy, to give a ringing cry, or to sing aloud. When the temple was restored after the exile, when they were returning from the exile into Babylon, we also see that um, those that are returned from Yehuda and you know, that were, were now had a similar, similar response when we look in the book of Ezra. In chapter 3, verse 11, it says, And they responded by praising and giving thanks to Yahweh, for he is good, and his loving kindness toward Israel is forever. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised Yahweh, because the foundation of the house was laid. This was a, this was a moment of ecstatic joy. And when they shouted with a shout, it was a ringing cry of praise for Yahweh's presence and the foundation being laid. Well, guess what? We well, don't need to guess, you know. Yeshua Messiah is the rock of our deliverance. He is the cornerstone. He is the foundation that's been laid. Are we giving a ringing cry as we're being built up in set apartness for Him? It goes on to say that those that, have, that saw the temple before, also they cried so loud when they saw the foundation yeah. that they couldn't distinguish between the yeah. those that were you know, ecstatic and those who, who were crying. Yes. It's the same joy for the yes. simple being. Because it also says, but the, the new one will be greater than the former. Which again, a shadow picture. We have the Levitical priesthood, and in the book of Hebrews we see it's something that was established but is now nearing, uh, it's fading, it's, it's disappearing. disappearing, which because there was still service happening. But the new has come in, it's far greater, because Messiah, now the embodiment of what that, the former, was a picture of, it was great. 
but the embodiment of Messiah is greater. And so therefore, what kind of cry and ringing sound of praise ought to we be bringing our master? Remember, it's also done in obedience. Because when you are truly obedient and you experience the blessing and the consuming of fire of Yahweh in your life, that's when you can be ignited to be praising him. We spoke last week of not putting the fire out, but fan into flame the good deposit that's been put in us. So therefore, we, we need to understand that you know what? Yes, this world refuses to obey the master, but it's that's because they don't want to know him. Mm. You know, as people that have entered into covenant, we can still have the Renan kind of worship with lifted hands and set apartness to our master, despite the depravity of the world. Because just as when they returned from exile, they, they were reminded what it was like in exile because of their disobedience. Now having returned, the temple was not yet even built. They just The foundation was just done. So we have this picture. We are still being built up. We're not complete yet as a building, dwelling place for Yahweh to come and be in the midst of. But the fact that the foundation's been laid, that's enough to cause us to be celebrating our deliverance and working it out with fear and trembling with set-apart hands, not deviating from the pattern. Because if we do, we may risk being cast out as a stone that has leprosy. Anybody want to share their thoughts on this chapter before we go look at what not to do? So this chapter sets up the scene of, wow, Yahweh's presence. We get so excited. Be on guard that that excitement doesn't let you lose sight of obedience. Mm. That's the, the flow that we see. The, the contrast, I would say, with this chapter and the next one is how when you do the right thing, you get the presence of Yahweh. But to do the wrong thing, you get consumed by the fire. Yes. But when you go to 1 Corinthians 3, it talks about the fire that will test your works. Yes. So the fire tested their works and it was acceptable. Yes. It was the right works. Yes. Mm. And yeah. everyone will be tested through fire. Yeah. And because of Corinthians talks about what type of works you do. Yes. If it's, it's going to be burnt up and you'll scarcely, you'll get there, but you'll just get, <laughs> yeah. you know, but if it's gold, it'll be refined. It'll yes. be a, a, a yeah. presentable, acceptable offering. Yeah. Who'd like to read chapter 10? And Nadav and Abihu, the sons of Aharon, each took his fire holder and put fire in it, and put incense in it, and brought strange fire before Yahweh, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from Yahweh and consumed them, and they died before Yahweh. Then Moshe said to Aharon, This is what Yahweh spoke, saying, By those who come near me, let me be set apart, and before all the people, let me be esteemed. And Aharon was silent. And Moshe called to Mishael and to Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Come near, take your brothers from before the set-apart place out of the camp. So they came near and took them by their long shirts out of the camp, as Moshe had said. And Moshe said to Aaron and to Elzar and to Itamar, his sons, Do not unbind your heads nor tear your garments, lest you die, and wrath come upon all the people. But let your brothers, all the house of Israel, bewail the burning which Yahweh has kindled. And do not go out from the door of the tent of appointment, lest you die. For the anointing oil of Yahweh is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moshe. And Yahweh spoke to Aharon, saying, Do not drink wine or strong drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tent of appointment, lest you die a law forever throughout your generations, so as to make a distinction between the set-apart and the profane, between the unclean and the clean, and to teach the children of Israel all the laws which Yahweh has spoken to them by the hand of Moshe. And Moshe spoke to Aharon and to Elzar and to Itamar, his sons who were left, Take the grain offering that is left over from the offerings made by fire to Yahweh, and eat it, without leaven beside the slaughter place, for it is most set apart. And you shall eat it in a set apart place, because it is yours by law and your sons by law, 
of offering made by fire to Yahweh, for so I have been commanded. And the breast of the wave offering and the thigh of the contribution you eat in a clean place, you and your sons and your daughters with you, for they are yours by law, and your sons by law, which are given from the slaughterings of the peace offerings of the children of Israel. The thigh of the contribution are, and the breast of the wave offering they bring with the offerings of fat made by fire, to bring as a wave offering before Yahweh, and it shall be yours and your sons with you by a law forever, as Yahweh has commanded. And Moshe diligently looked for the goats of the sin offering and saw it was burned up. And he was wroth with Eleazar and Itamar, the sons of Aaron, who were left, saying, Why have you not eaten the sin offering in a set-apart place, since it is most set-apart? And Elohim has given it to you to bear the crookedness of the congregation, to make atonement for them before Yahweh. See, its blood was not sprinkled inside the set-apart place. You should have eaten it without fail in a set-apart place, as I have commanded. And Aaron said to Moshe, See, today they have brought their sin offering and their ascending offering before Yahweh, and matters like these have come to me. If I had eaten the sin offering today, would it have been right in the eyes of Yahweh? And when Moshe heard that, it was good in his eyes. Okay, so Nadav and Avihu kind of quickly put out the joy that was being celebrated by everybody, you know. All the joy and excitement and jubilation that Israel were feeling, um, you would have thought that they'd learned a great lesson. I mean, they'd been through a lot already but to the, when the, before they got to this point, you know. And so they now, you'd think that they would be seeking to heed the instructions of Yahweh very carefully, seeing the impact of what obedience brings. And so yet what we see at the start of this chapter is the exact opposite. And not just from somebody on the outskirts of the camp, which was dealt with by Yahweh on the journey, but from those that were supposed to be leading others in uh, the, the right of worship of drawing near to Yahweh. And so this uh, chapter carries wonderful lessons for us on how we are to approach Yahweh, how we are to carry Yahweh. That's why we read today the account from Shemuel Aleph, you know, or Shemuel Bet, which one? It's Aleph. Shemuel Aleph, I think it is. Bet. Bet. It's one chronicle. Shemuel Aleph and one chronicle. Yes, about David Bet, and, and the Ark Bet. of Yahweh. I'm saying Shemuel Bet and one chronicles. Yeah, I'm getting mixed up between the Aleph and the Bet. But we'll get to the right passage later. Don't worry. What we see in, you'll see the thread of why we're looking at this, um, all these passages in this Torah portion highlighting how we are to be bearing our master, how we are to be having his yoke around our neck and bearing his burden, carrying his presence and representing him wherever we are. And so we are to draw, be careful to draw near to Yahweh exactly as he instructs us to do. Because any approach to Yahweh done outside of the prescribed instructions of his word will be rejected by him and not accepted. Nadav means generous, or, uh, or to incite, or to make offerings willingly, you know. Um, it actually can also mean giving as a free will offering, which you think having that kind of name represents a lot in terms of everything that they'd been set apart and appointed to, you know, because, you know, when people think offering, they think, oh, it's lots of work, oh, it's this. But when it's done from free will and it's choice, that's why Yahweh says he loves a joyous giver because it comes from an internal joy of wanting to do what's right. And not even a view who were doing what's right in the process of being set apart. They watched their father do everything right, saw Yahweh accept it. And then Avihu also means he is my father. So here you have two sons, free will offering, he is my father, sons that represent a picture of what you, you think that they could excel in. You know, and yet these two sons didn't live up to the full potential of the names that they were given. They paid the price for stepping out of the clear instructions of Yahweh to do what they thought was right in their own eyes. You know, bringing profane or strange fire before Yahweh. And as we break down 
this chapter a little bit, we can see wh um, why what they did was wrong. Firstly, we are told that they each took their own fire holder. Now, you can interpret it in a couple of ways, in a sense. And it, it leaves open that interpretation because it teaches us a valuable lesson. Mm -hmm. You know, what they did here is they mixed the worship and took which was profane or common and mixed it with the commands and making that which was supposed to be set apart a common thing, something that's not acceptable. They took their own fire holders and... and in one sense, not the fire holder designed specifically for the task, or why I said earlier they took their own fire holders, what makes their fire holders their own, because they would have had service as sons and priests in the, in the tabernacle, is that by not following the clear instructions, it made their fire holder their own. You know? And so they had made their own mix, so to speak, you know? And so they... They didn't do what was required to go into the set-apart place with what was instructed. They made their own mix, and it made their fire holders strange or profane and no longer pure. And this is a, a clear picture of so many people today who tend to mimic the real and try to present their worship and obedience as being real, when in fact the object of their worship is of their own making. And it's clearly outside the very commands of Yahweh. They then took that which was their own and they put fire in it. You know, the Hebrew word for put is is uh, comes from the root word nathan, which is um, to give, to consecrate, to dedicate, to contribute. So, and and it's fine in its typical understanding of the word. You know, because from nathan we get the nethanim, the given ones, the dedicated ones. You know. However, what they did was simply provide their own fire. They didn't draw near with that which was to be dedicated in service to Yahweh. And as noble as in, and sincere as they may thought they had been, well, they wouldn't have thought afterwards they were dead. But as at the point of their action, thinking, oh, what we're doing is right, and think, check at us now. Mm. So many today are being caught in the same deceptive position. When they are thinking that their worship, there's nothing wrong with their worship. You know? Mm. As the fire did not come from the fire which Yahweh commanded, but they're making a fire of their own making and thinking it's acceptable, but Yahweh says, that's not me, it's not my instructions, it's not how I told you to worship me. That's why the true worshippers, when Yeshua was here, and he said very clear that is, the time is now for the worshippers, true worshippers, to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. You know, Not in falsehood of a false spirit. That's why we are to cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit so that we worship and the Torah is spiritual. But what the people were doing is they were taking aspects of the Torah but now bringing their fleshly uh, um, ways in to present an offering that they could control people. That's really what a lot of the fleshly worship has done today. It's giving people like Nadav and Avihu who were now priests and so-called leaders within the the service, their means of saying, you do what we do. They're not following the pattern that's clearly handed down from Moshe to Haran and then to the sons. So Elazar and Ithamar would now take up that role again of what should be done correctly. And so too do we have a clear picture from Moshe to the embodiment of Messiah reflecting what Moshe had and given by the Father, do exactly according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. Now, as his sons, we do exactly. We don't deviate from that, you know. So many people today are trying to make their own fire, so to speak, in their attempt of approaching Yahweh with worship that actually is not acceptable in his eyes. It doesn't matter how brilliantly produced it is. You know, it's it's it, we all know that Satan was cast out of heaven and he was considered as one of the covering cherubs that kind of was one of the top worshipping cherubs, you know, or, or shining ones that was cast out. Now, of course, he knows how to put on a good show, you know, and he knows how to get people so excited in the flesh. And from a fleshly point of view, it can be a production of excellence in the flesh but it's not an excellent spirit before the master and it's not acceptable before him.
You know, what's happening at large today is that will people make a form of worship? It's actually constructed out of their way of selfishness of how they want to approach Yahweh. You know, and add that which is set apart. They add bits of what comes from the word of set apart and they attempt to draw near to the Creator. And if we approach Yahweh in any other manner than what He's prescribed, then it's unacceptable before His face. We've been given His Sabbath and His feasts of how we draw near as a bride together. And we are to do it according to his clear instructions, you know. And what we have to understand is Nadav and Avihu did what was not commanded. Now that's something important. Because there's a lot of people doing what's not commanded. Like Israel got so far from the truth and profaned their worship that they even offered up their children in the fire to Molech. And Yahweh says, it didn't, I never commanded this. It didn't even come in my heart to do such abominable things. So where did people get instructed to do these kind of things? Is there something you want to... Yeah, I was just saying, I mean, when were they supposed to use their senses? Only on Yom Kippur? Yeah. I mean, there's no other instruction in No. Anything. You take your senses and just go. But that's what I'm saying. So they, it wasn't used according to the instructions of when they should go in. You know, and when they should take. It's possibly due to this incident that what Caroline's talking about, Vayikra 16, the whole chapter sets the clear prescribed manner of what must take place on Yom Kippur. Now, it, it might be that this instruction was clearly laid down based on the events that took place with Nadav and Avihu. Okay, where it says um, in verse 12 to 13 of chapter 16, it says, She'll take a fire holder filled with burning coals of fire from the slaughter place before Yahweh, with his hands filled with sweet incense, beaten fine, shall bring it inside the veil, and he shall put the incense on the fire before Yahweh, and the cloud of incense shall cover the lid of atonement, which is on the witness, lest he die. So a clear standard of how you draw near to Yahweh was laid down before Aharon, because Nadav and Avihu presumed to just approach Yahweh any which way they want. You know, And many may argue that if this had not yet been instructed, then it seems a little harsh to have these two consumed in the fire of Yahweh's wrath. But the fact is that they may have, they may have been taught already by Moshe what was to do in that regard, but even if they weren't, the fact that they did something that they were not taught to do is another lesson for us. You don't just go and assume, well, I'm not really sure how we should, so we'll just do it this way. You know, you do what's prescribed, you know. This emphasizes the importance of not doing that which you think is right, but you don't know. Mm. And how many people do that today? I think today, the, the people of today, they think they know Yahweh, yes. but they don't. Because if they knew him, they will know that he said, I change not. Yeah. <clears throat> and if you do something that's not from me, I'm going yeah. to die. Yeah. So if you can just put that in your head. Yes. So every time they say, no, it's changed, mm. or we can do it differently, Actually, they say they don't know. Yep. They don't know you. Yep. That's what they're saying. They're saying, yes, that actions are saying, I hate you mm -hmm. and I don't know you. Mm -hmm. Just because someone hasn't received or learnt an instruction doesn't give them the license to assume what can be done by their own design and their own making. Mm -hmm. And think about the chaos in many denominations of westernized culture today when they've cast the instructions aside. So, of course, they're making a design of their own making and presenting a profane worship. We are to do what's commanded. Burning incense near temples was common in most pagan religions, and it continues to, to this day through Catholicism and other worship rituals that are done with other religions. And this is strange or profane in the eyes of Yahweh because it's nothing that he instructed. It's not what he commanded, you know. Our life of praise unto Yahweh must be carefully brought in accordance to his word because we seek out how he wants us to worship him. So we don't just go with the flow. It doesn't work like that. We have to be precise in understanding. That's why in Hebrews, I believe Shaul wrote, he rebukes some who ought to have been teachers by now, but it's like they have to learn over and over. Are you not actually seeking out? His kingdom and his righteousness. Because seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Righteousness is to God to do all he's commanded. So if you're seeking righteousness, you're seeking the commands on how to live. But if you're not doing that, 
then anything that you think you're doing will be regarded as, I do not know you. Away from me, you who work lawlessness. Because the priests, if you think about it, only the high priest goes into the most set apart place. Mm. Yeah. Yes. The other priests help teach the people how to be obedient. Yes. And for us, the same. We teach people how to be obedient. Only Yeshua can intercede. Yes. Yeah. I mean, he's the only one that can... He's the only one that can get there onto the throne, <laughs> you know. When you spoke about the, the, the curse of, of the Torah, that's basically what we are talking about here now. Yes. Because we who God, hear God and do, we put ourselves under the law, under, under His commands, yes. under His protection. protection yeah. under the, and those who don't, don't. Yeah. So they do not fall under the protection. No. They do not fall under the his laws and his right mm. yeah. No, definitely. If we approach Yahweh in any other manner that he's commanded, then we have to realize that it's strange and not acceptable. It's a wake-up call. It's be, it was a wake-up call for all of us. But that, again, is a, a lesson on his mercy. Because we all could have been destroyed, like Nadav and Abihu, like Hananya and Shapira. Mm. But thank Yahweh for his mercy, his loving commitment to... Abraham's, the covenant he made with Abraham, mm. you know. And so, they put incense in their fire holders, and the incense that they brought into the tent of appointment and burned on the slaughter place of incense, they didn't put fire on the, on the censer, because as Karlin said, it's only the high priest that would take the censer mm. before and take the incense that was and put it on the, the fire holder. The incense that was brought for the slaughter place of incense, was put on the fire of the slaughter place. It wasn't put on the fire holder. Yeah. Mm. So do you see what they did? They mixed everything together. They you, you kind of wonder why they had fire holders in the first place. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> well, you know, I remember that when they brought those 250 <coughs> leaders, each bring their own fire yeah. holders. So it represented yeah. the authority of Yahweh's presence because the fire was also symbolic of Yahweh's consuming presence that Moshe looked into the bush when he saw. Mm. Now you either carry that presence, that's the fire in us, we, that, that, that menorah represents. So they did have fire holders because that would represent the light and life of Yahweh in them. Mm. You know? And when you, rep, when you present it wrong, it's put out. You know? And so... We, we see that the, the Hebrew word for strange comes from the root word zara, which means a, loath, a loathsome thing. And it's often translated as unauthorized or profane. Now, zara comes from the root word zur, which means strange, stranger, adulterer, or enemy. And so what they brought was the fire of the enemy. It was an adulterous fire a mixed fire in their attempted means of drawing near to Yahweh. You want to provoke Yahweh? Bring enemy ways before him. In looking at these events, we are reminded just how close it is, how small a line it is, in a sense, between that which is set apart and that which is strange or abominable or profane or loathsome in Yahweh's eyes. It's that small little compromise where you think you know better that can be a cause of being rejected rather than accepted. Nadav and Avihu may have, you know, the incense that they used might have been correct. As it does say, it doesn't say the incense that they brought was wrong because the incense was made. Remember, it was only also supposed to be used for the set-apart service, not for self. It was the source of the fire that was wrong. And by that I mean it's a clear picture of, again, we all have that fire in us. But if, even if everything was done just the way he said, what we have to take note is that the motive was wrong. And that, that's what represents a picture of one's own fire. It's that motive within you. Why are you doing it? Why did Nadav and Avihu get up and do this? Mm. What actually made them do this act? Something motivated them inside, and I'll tell you what I think it is, as an overall picture, it was the flesh that motivated them. And we see in Romans, when Shaul writes 
The flesh cannot submit to Elohim. It's an enmity with Elohim. Therefore, when you're operating in your emotions, because they all felt pumped up, everybody was crying aloud, and the whole two million plus people crying aloud. Think about it. Aaron and his two sons, and I believe his other sons were there too, because it was Aaron and his sons. But I mean, it's five people and Moshe standing there, and the crowd's cheering Yahweh. Two of the sons thought, oh, check it, this. We the man. We the men. And they allowed emotions of others even and received the, what they received as praise of men when the praise was being given to Yahweh. And they assumed, again, that they could now act in that puffed up state and motivated to bring what was wrong after everything was done right. Be careful when you are getting praises from people. I mean, it is, we're told, let another one praise you, not yourself. So don't get, but what I mean is, be careful that you're not allowing the praises of man to puff you up, to think you have some kind of better status or stature than others. You know? Whether it's for power or self-will or just being caught in the emotion of the moment, motives that are done according to the flesh are foreign in Yahweh's eyes. It's strange. It's not right. And it, it, it may have seemed like it looked like the set-apart spirit, but since Moshe had not commanded them to do this, it was clearly a different spirit. And that's an important thing to realize today. It doesn't matter how great your idea is. Or even if everyone around you agrees. Think about that. Oh, the masses can't be wrong. Oh, yes, they can. It must line up with Yahweh's instruction. If it does not, then it's more, most likely going to turn out to be strange and profane. Anybody want to share their thoughts on understanding this clear difference? What we have to see when they were consumed by fire in verse 2 as we see from the last chapter to this chapter, it's Yahweh's fire that either accepts you or he, consume, or he destroys you. You know? The very same fire of Yahweh accepts that which is right and, it, and, and destroys that which is wrong. The question you should ask yourself is this. Is he consuming you in his good pleasure and that fire is continually burning that you can just... Give that ringing cry of praise unto him, not as a fleshly response, but as that reality of submission to obeying him and receiving the blessing of his presence, offering your life as a pleasing offering that's well pleasing in your worship before him, or will you be found to be one who will end up, end up being consumed in his wrath due to profanities and strange standards and compromised worship ways? The reality of this reminds me of the rebuke that Israel was given in Yeshayahu Isaiah chapter 1. When he basically said to them in verse 19 to 20, he gave a conditional clause, which is, a, Yahweh gives conditional clauses. They say, if then scenario. Yeah. If you submit and obey, then you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. Mm -hmm. Now the Hebrew root word, the root verb that's used for eat and devoured is the same root word, achal, which means to eat, consume, devour, or be devoured. So what Yahweh is saying to us is eat right and live, or live wrong and be eaten, or burn with zeal for Yahweh, or be burned in judgment. You see, Daniel's three friends, Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael, when they went into the fire, thrown into the fire, and they were not burned. They were protected by Yahweh, who was walking in the fire with them. Mm. So this was a clear witness to Nebuchadnezzar that this is Yahweh. Yeah. He's the one that decides who burns or who's accepted. So even when man tries to burn you, so to speak, when you are in Yahweh's presence and being accepted by Him, the fires of this world cannot harm you 
or the judgments of this world cannot harm you. But when you put yourself outside of Yahweh's consuming presence, his fire will destroy you and the judgment of this world can also destroy you. Mm. Verse 3 is one of the most important verses, I think, that I've come across in Scripture. When it says, Moshe said to Aharon, this is what Yahweh spoke, saying, By those who come near me, let me be set apart. And before all the people, let me be esteemed. So what Yahweh is saying is, anyone who comes to me, let me be set apart to them. This, and let Yahweh be esteemed. Mm. Now he rebukes Israel in Malachi. He says, if I am a father, where is my esteem? You know? Where is my esteem? Where is my love? Where is my obedience that I should be having? When we come before Yahweh, the question we have to ask ourselves is, how set apart is Yahweh to you? Now we know Yahweh is set apart. But in your mindset, how set apart is that set apartness to you? How do you understand how set apart he is. It might sound like a pedantic question, but just think about it for a moment. I ask this simply because there are many people today who are claiming to walk in Messiah, claiming to live a faithful walk of obedience, yet their actions don't always line up with their confession. And it possibly is due to the fact that Yahweh is not totally set apart to them. If he was set apart to Nadav and Avihu, they would not have brought the offering or the strange fire that they brought. Mm. Too many treat Yahweh as common, as a buddy. You know, Yahweh is not our buddy. Mm. He's our creator and redeemer. He's our sovereign. You know, and most people treat him as a buddy while neglecting the truth of his word mm. and his set apart nature and character and think, ah, oh, yeah, he'll understand. Oh, yeah, ah, man, he knows my heart. Wow, you don't know how set apart he is. You know? It's very clear that the sons of Aharon were not taking Yahweh seriously enough. And that's why Yahweh is saying, anyone who draws near to me, I must be set apart to them. In other words, you better take this seriously. It's not a joke. By bringing strange fire, we're able to see that they simply chose to do the things of their own way and neglect to do what was commanded. And by doing so, their acts of disobedience showed that they didn't take serious the instructions that Yahweh had given through Moshe to Aharon and now as sons were, were to be obedient in. And it just shows you how quickly people can say, ah, now that's not important. Then Yahweh is not that set apart to you. Because if he is set apart to you, you will be digging into this word to find out what set apartness entails, you know? You know, the matters of the Torah that were given through Moshe, mm -hmm. Yahweh's commands to the sons of Aharon were strange. So they brought strange fire. And this is a rebuke that Yahweh gave to the house of Israel in the book of Hosea. Chapter 8, verse 12, it says, I have written for him numerous matters of my Torah, they were regarded as strange. Think about that for a moment. So many people, you know, many today regard the Torah as strange. And as a result, they loathe the laws of Yahweh. They literally hate thinking about obedience to the Torah. Yes. And this will simply re result in being abandoned, destroyed and consumed if they do not repent. Because the book of Hosea is actually a call return to Yahweh. Even though that you found my thing strange, I'm telling you to return to me. That's an act of Yahweh's compassion and mercy. Still with a voice crying out, saying, if you come to me, I'll clean you up. As I've mentioned, we have Nadav and Avihu in the Tanakh and we have Hananiah and Shapira who lied to the Spirit about the price that they got for the land they sold. Because they wanted to put on a show. They acted in the emotion of their flesh. And what they brought as an offering was not accepted, acceptable by Yahweh. You know, many people, you can't outgive Yahweh. You can't come and say, look what I did for Yahweh. Yeah. Then your motive is already wrong. Mm -hmm. You know. When you think of these sobering words in this chapter, in verse 3, something also strikes us. It's like, you know, at the end of this verse, let me be set apart and let all 
um, and let the uh, and before all the people let me be esteemed. Then it says, and Aharon was silent. I mean, that in itself, just that statement in itself. Picture the scene. His two sons were just destroyed by the fire of Yahweh. After the joyous celebration of Yahweh accepting the offering that was done exactly the way he wanted it to be done. Aaron had no answer to Yahweh. Why did you do this? You know, a lot of people say, why did Elohim do this? They would do well to learn to be silent. Yaakov teaches us, be slow to speak, quick to listen. And this is a, a clear picture here. It's often the biggest mouth or the biggest talkers are the ones who are living compromised lifestyles. And they'll chirp and criticize everything that others do, while they would do best to learn to keep quiet. Consumed by fire, you know, and we see a lot of people and a lot of people in this world getting destroyed because Yahweh's wrath is being poured out because of the profanity of worship that's being presented. Don't fall along with those who try and blame Elohim for something. You know, and this, this picture of being set apart is something that we are continually learning. When Yahweh says, be set apart for I am set apart. So if Yahweh truly is set apart to you, then it will matter what you do in your life. As your life reflects a worship unto him in everything you do. It's not an event on a Shabbat where now you've, you've tidied yourself up, you know. Yes, I'll remind you again. We don't come with sloppiness into the master's presence. Because if he was physically in the flesh here, would you come to the gathering the way you would normally come? If he was literally sitting in one of the seats. Now he is with us. That's the reality. Yes. But I'm trying to say how our minds often work in flesh and spirit. You know? How would your motivation and your heart be if he was literally taking up a physical seat here in the gathering? It shouldn't be different because he is with us. But when we understand again, if Yahweh is not set apart to you, it's not just putting on event for a gathering. What about every single day and how you shine the light as a witness of who you serve or not? Because if he's not that set apart to you, then you won't be set apart because you'll easily compromise. You'll easily cut corners. You'll easily find an escape route or way out of doing something that you know you should do, but it will take more effort to do that. Why does it take more effort? Because you haven't trained yourself to do it the way it should be done because his right ways are not heavy. And so this is a wonderful lesson for us, you know. We see very clearly that Yahweh's given us the standard of set-apartness, and he's given us the standard by which we must esteem him. The Hebrew word for esteem, which you all know, what's the Hebrew word for esteem? Kavod, or kaved. Um, the one who esteems, the root verb kaved means to be heavy, weighty, or burdensome, to give high esteem, respect, and honor. And the noun is kavod, which means honor, esteem, reverence, or, or, or being splendid. So what we see here is when we see in the ten words, honor your mother and your father so that you live long, the first command with a promise, you know, live long in the land that Yahweh is giving you, we understand that that again, right through the Proverbs, the parables of Shilomo, we see a thread there that, the, the, the father and mother is a, a clear picture of the commands in the Torah of Elohim. The wisdom and the commands that lead us, that guide us, that we are to be led by, that we are to submit to. And so when we give weight, when we esteem our father and our mother, spiritually speaking, we are the, the Torah is personified as a mother that teaches and instructs her children in, in, in Proverbs. And then the father is the one is pictured as the, the one who disciplines. And, in, and obviously we're told that if a father doesn't discipline a son, he doesn't love him. Yeah. So he disciplines those he loves. And so we understand a very clear picture that Yaakov he loved, Esau he hated. So we understand he loves his covenanted people, the people who are walking in spirit. Esau is a picture of the flesh. And so we understand with this giving esteem or uh, um, 
respecting or honoring, it's the word kavod, which means we give weight to what Yahweh says and instructs. Now the opposite to that is to make light of. So you get the picture in the Hebraic mindset of be that which is to be burdensome and heavy and that which is light, so to speak. When he says my commands are not heavy, it doesn't mean you don't get to do it. It means you can give me esteem, but you've got to respect and honor and give weight to what I instruct you and discipline you in. When you cast it aside, there's no esteem. And that's what Israel were doing when you see in the book of Malachi, they had turned the table of Yahweh into a despicable table. One that was not representing Yahweh's presence or the weight of his presence and his set of partners at all. So we have to understand that many people will recite, Our Father is in the heavens, let your name be set apart, while they're not bringing esteem to his name. They can recite the words, but their lives are not reflecting what these words as a pattern ought to remind us. When we're drawing near to our Father in the heavens, yes, let your name be set apart. It's falling into this Torah command. You draw near to me, let me be set apart to you. So when we see the pattern by which our Master teaches us to pray, we can't be coming to Yahweh as a buddy. We have to come to him knowing that he's set apart, and I'm doing my utmost to pursue set-apartness. Then he will receive me. David cries out, saying, I know that he hears my prayers. Not because he was arrogant, but because he sought Yahweh. And he made mistakes, but he got up and he confessed and he continued to seek Yahweh. Because why? Because he ran to Yahweh knowing Yahweh's set apart. But when you don't know Yahweh's set apart and you're not bringing weight to obeying his word, then you will treat him as a celestial vending machine, as many do today. And it sounds crude and cruel, and it's exactly what it is, you know. Aaron and his sons were not allowed to touch that, the two sons that had just died. Other relatives were called to take the bodies out of the camp. Aharon was not to mourn for his sons. Why? Because they were still in the process of doing service in the tabernacle. And what this teaches us is a valuable lesson, is that, Serving Yahweh, we represent life, you know. They were to stay in their service and not go out of the door of the tent of appointment lest they die. They were not allowed to mourn the loss of their relatives as they were still in the service of the dwelling place. And this pictures for us that Aaron and his sons were representing the Torah at that point. Now this doesn't mean we see in the Torah provision is made for a priest to bury his own family. I mean, people bury their own family, direct family. You know, and we also see with the travels of Israel that the entire nation mourned for Yosef. They mourned for Aharon 30 days. They mourned for Moshe. So it's not that you can't have a period of grieving. That's not what this is saying here. The picture that we get is in our service to Yahweh, we represent life, not death. You know, Devarim 32 verse 47 says that the Torah is not a worthless word to you. Everything that Moshe has commanded us is not a worthless word for us because it is our life. And by this word, we prolong our days on the soil which we pass over the yard and to possess. Yeshua, when, a taught, when, when somebody that was wanting to seek him, you know, wanting to be a taught one, you know, he said, you know, oh, first can I, you know, go and um, take care, bury my father. Mm -hmm. Now, we have to understand when he, Yeshua then said to him, let the dead bury the dead. You know, those whom he has called must take a more set apart path. They've got a job to do while they're still living. What, that, what he was saying to that person was, that person's father had not literally died yet. He wanted to go and stay at the house, wait till his father died, get the inheritance, then come follow Yeshua. And he's saying, let the dead bury the dead. Because he could see the motive of this man's heart is, I'll follow you when I know I've got myself sorted. I'll follow you when I know I've got tomorrow's rent paid. You know? When I get the inheritance, then I'll give you everything, Yahweh. I'll follow you wholeheartedly. Let the people that are not representing life take care of themselves. You shouldn't worry about tomorrow. You want to follow me in your commitment? It starts now. It doesn't start when you think you've got yourself all together. That's the lesson that we see here. You know? 
And then comes the, one of the most crucial parts in the Torah that we need to expand on and we understand why this part in the Torah is here. After the actions of Nadav and Avihu, Moshe was clearly instructed, or Yahweh spoke directly to Aaron. It wasn't even through Moshe. This was how, I mean, it's almost like you see everything serious, but it's like really got serious now. And he says, do not drink wine or strong drink when you your son, nor your sons with you when you go into the tent of appointment, lest you die a law forever throughout your generations. Mm -hmm. So as to make a distinction between the set apart and the profane and between the unclean and the, and the clean. And to also to teach the children of Israel all the laws which Yahweh has spoken to them by the hand of Moshe. So we see a clear standard here that it may be that the reason that, uh, that Nadav and Avihu had presented strange fire is that they may have just had a bit of celebration with a, a glass or two of something that they shouldn't have had, you know? And the primary instruction why they were not to have any drink or uh, wine or strong drink when they are doing service in the tabernacle was so that they could distinguish between the set apart and the profane. So that you're not like that, mm, I can't think about it now, oh, no. and it gets very grey, you know? Now, it's a clear instruction. When the priests were not in service, they have, in a, in, the, in a sense, a loophole of, well, now I can drink. Now we learn from this pattern because that was a law forever throughout their generations. Now their generations, as a Levitical priesthood, we come to the order of Melchizedek, and so now we come into the generations of Melchizedek. That's what we're grafted into. But we learn from the Levitical priesthood pattern of what is a clear instruction so that we understand what it means in Messiah. Now, whenever you were in service, you, it's clear you don't drink. I mean, that's a no-brainer. It's quite simple. The question we have to ask ourselves in Messiah is, when are we not in service? So, let me just put it real plain and simple for you. This isn't a restriction for those who are appointed to lead. Because we see the qualities and the attributes that Shaul teaches to Timothy or Timotheus and Titos of what an overseer or a deacon or anything should be. Yeah. And one of those is not a drunkard, not given to wine or not given to much wine, etc. So we understand the qualities. It's quite clear. Because if somebody's given to those things, they can't distinguish. So there are standards, certainly, of characteristics that would shape somebody to be called to a position of, a, of leadership over the body to equip the body, yes. But we are all the body of Messiah. He's our head, right? So we are some of, we're all different parts, whether a hand, a foot, an arm, an ear, a mouth, a nose, an eye, whatever it is, we're all one together in him. He is our head. Now, as long as he is interceding in the set-apart place, we are in service. For a moment when we think, I'm not in service, I can have a drink, we are by default saying that he's not in service. So then he's not that set-apart to you anymore. I hope you can connect the dots here. Because it's always, whenever I have a, a bit of a discussion and sometimes a, a friendly debate with some people, and showing various scriptures, I'm not going to go through all the scriptures today, but there's many scriptures you can look at. You can look at the notes on some of them, but it's very clear that the question you can ask anybody is when they're really just wanting their dop, you know, because they miss it. And for those who don't understand what dop is, their drink, their shot, their, you know, fix, whatever it is. Just ask them, oh, so are you not in service to Yahweh anymore or right now? Who decides when you're in or out? Because if you're grafted in, you're in. And when you think you're out, you're taking Yahweh out from the most set-apart place. And when our Savior is out from the most set-apart place, there's no intercession. So if there's no intercession and you are now saying you're out of service, who's interceding for you? Now the reality is, He is interceding for us. We don't put Him in or out, we put ourselves in or out. So that's why Yeshua says, stay in me and I will stay in you. So if we stay in him, he stays in us. We're seated with him in the heavenlies. Therefore, we're in service. Does that make sense? Does anybody disagree or does anybody have another thought on that or want to comment on that? Because it's, it's clear and simple from a process of service in our master. What many struggle with is the fleshly desires and motives that we held 
in a strange form of living. And so much so that there are many religions out there that actually promote the use of beverages that can intoxicate you and not cause you to think straight. Why? Because that's what the whore does. Now, when you think of strange, the concept of strange is also understood as what the whore gives to drink and make people drunk on the maddening adulteries of the whore because she's giving you strange wine, mixed wine. She's giving you... Now, strange can also under, be understood as something that is... or strange wine is something that's been intoxicated or made poisonous because it, it alters your state of reasoning. And so therefore, what, when, it, when it's presented with a mixed concoction, it takes elements of the truth, puts the poison of lawlessness in it, makes you drink it, and then how do you reason what's right or wrong? You can't. And that's where compromise leads in, and that's where the whore is relishing in many who are drinking her cup of whoring. And Yahweh reminds Yirmiyahu very clearly to tell Israel when he said, go take this cup and tell them to drink. Because we either partake of Yahweh's cup of grape juice at Pesach, remembering his death, and if we don't partake in that which, which supposes that we're in service and we partake in the Sabbaths and feasts of Yahweh correctly, if we don't partake in him, because Yeshua says, if you do not drink of me or eat of me, you have no part in me. Mm. You will drink Yahweh's cup of wrath. We see that in Chazon, where when his wrath is poured out, that's his wrath being forced upon those that wouldn't accept his offering of his life. So this, this chapter 11 or chapter 10 is a clear difference between chapter 9 where perfect obedience was accepted by Yahweh and chapter 10 where strange fire and drunkenness of whoring was consumed and destroyed by Yahweh. Kepha reminds us that we are a royal priesthood. So when some say, no, it's only for the priests, we're, we're a royal priesthood in Messiah. We're a chosen people, a set-apart nation. But we're a royal priesthood for what? Now, Kepha reminds us. It's in 1 Peter 2 verse 9 where it says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a set-apart nation, a people for a possession. That should proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. When you read that, you should be reminded of a covenant of marriage. Because it should take you to chapter 19 of Shemot, where Yahweh said to Moshe, you speak to the children of Israel and say to them, if you obey me, then you will be a people for a possession, a set-apart priesthood. You know? You will be my royal priesthood, my segula. You will be a chosen people if you obey me. So Kepha's reminding us of our marriage covenant and what we are to be obedient to. And when you just go to the previous eight verses, it tells you why we're called to be a royal priesthood or what for. And, and it says this in verses 1 to 8. Having put aside then all evil and all deceit and hypocrisies and envyings and all evil words, as newborn babes desire the unadulterated milk of the word in order that you grow by it, if indeed you have tasted that the master is good. Drawing near to him a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by Elohim and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a set-apart priesthood, to offer up slaughter, spiritual slaughter offerings acceptable to Elohim through Yeshua Messiah, because it is contained in the scripture. See, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, chosen, precious, and he who believes on him shall by no means be put to shame. This preciousness, then, is for you who believe. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders has rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock that makes for falling, who stumble because they are disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. See, it fits in nicely when we were talking about the celebration of the foundation being laid, the crying aloud. We are a chosen people to offer up spiritual slaughter offerings to our master. In order to do that effectively, and pleasing to our master, we should learn how to distinguish between the set apart and the profane. Because if you can't, 
then Yahweh is not set apart to you because you can only truly distinguish the set apart and the profane when Yahweh is set apart to you and you're being set apart and you're pursuing righteousness. And when you see the words of Yeshayahu, it speaks the, of the result of drinking instead of serving faithfully. In Yeshayahu 5, it says in verse 11 to 13, Woe to those who rise early in the morning pursuing strong drink, who stay up late at night. Wine inflames them. And the lyre and the harp, the tambourine and the flute and wine are in their feasts. I mean, they're having a, a jolly old time. But they do not regard the deeds of Yahweh. He's not set apart to them. Nor see the work of his hands. Therefore, my people have gone into exile because they have no knowledge and their esteemed men are starved and their crowd dried up with, with thirst. Drinking intoxicated beverages leads to having no regard for the deeds of Yahweh. You know? Yeshiao 28 verse 7, it says, These two have gone astray through wine and through strong drink, wandered about. Priest and prophet have gone astray through strong drink. They are swallowed up by wine. They wander about through strong drink. They go astray in vision. They stumble in right ruling. In Yechezkiel 44 verse 21, which is speaking of the millennial reign and the Tzadok priesthood, which is a reflection of the righteous ones, the given ones that have actually now come in to serve in the millennial reign, those who have stayed in the master. It says, no priest is to drink wine when he comes into the inner court. Shaul writes in Ephesians 5 verse 15 to 21, see then that you walk exactly not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are wicked. See, so then, do not be foolish, but understand what the desire of Yahweh is. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is loose behavior, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to each other in psalms and songs of praise and spiritual songs, singing and striking the strings in your heart to the Master, giving thanks always for all to Elohim the Father, in the name of our Master, Yehoshua Messiah, subjecting yourselves to each other in the fear of Elohim. You see the singing songs and the striking the strings of your heart to Elohim versus the rebuke in Yeshiyahu where wine, uh, wine, wine inflames them and they've got tambourines and lyres and they're all singing. So there can be an, a, a presentation of what looks like joy, but it's a fleshly response of profane worship versus true set-apart spiritual worship, worship lived out as we walk in, our, in, in the flesh. Amen? Moshe then instructs Aaron and his two remaining sons to eat what was left of the grain offering, and where, uh, which he did not do. And when Moshe came, he said, why did you not eat the sin offering? Mm. Because the blood of the sin offering was not taken into the set-apart place. Now let me understand, Kalina and I were just talking, when you read last week's Torah portion and you go through, even you've got to go and speak, uh, look at uh, Vayikra 16 and get the holistic view. It sounds almost like what if the when you were saying last week about the sin offering, how is it they must eat the sin offering when the blood of the sin offering must go inside the set apart place? Mm. Moshe came and said, "Why did you not eat the sin offering when it wasn't taken into the set apart place?" The only time the sin offering is taken into the mo into the set apart place or to the most set apart place and sprinkled on the on the slaughter place and then on the mercy seat is on Yom Kippur. All the other time, once a year. All the other times, the sin offerings are poured out next to the bronze slaughter place. The blood, the blood of the sin offering, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So the blood of the sin offering is only taken into the set apart place on Yom Kippur. That's why the priests can eat of the sin offerings of, of the animals where the blood is not taken into the set apart place. So on Yom Kippur, the priest would not eat the sin offering. Or when he offers it for himself. Okay, so now he didn't eat of this sin offering. And Aaron says, would it be right in Yahweh's eyes if I ate of this today, knowing that he ate, if he ate of this, his sons sinned and brought strange fire. Now he would basically be saying that I would be partaking in accepting that what they, you know, that sin offering that actually is them. I can't have that. Well, he couldn't bear their crookedness. He couldn't bear their crookedness. They were judged. Because why it was the priest's duty to eat the sin offering is to bear the crookedness of the sins of the people or the sins of the, the one bringing the sin offering. Mm. He couldn't bear their crookedness. They had already been judged. And Moshe saw that it was right in his eyes. 
Okay, for a moment, Moshe said, what is, what's going on? Why aren't you doing prescribed? Okay, right, you're right. You know, it's acceptable. What you're saying is right. Now, the offering was acceptable because Aharon burnt it on the slaughter place. There's only two ways by which, you know, he didn't violate the Torah in any way by not eating it. Because there, an offering is acceptable only when it's either burnt up or eaten. It's either food for the fire or the priests eat it. Then it's acceptable. So he burnt the offering up and he said, I can't eat that. I can't be partaking that because it's already been judged, but it's burnt up. And it was accepted by Yahweh and Moshe then made it clear, yes, this is acceptable. You know. Moshe was pleased that he saw um, Aaron was finally seeing that eating sacrificial animals actually meant more than just a meal provided for these men who had no inheritance of their own so that they could serve the entire nation. And it's the same thing when we think about when we come to have that remembrance meal of, ya, of our master at Pesach. We don't come because it's just a nice meal. You know, and even Shabbat, we don't come because the food is better than, you know, what I have in the week. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. If you're splashing out in the week, that's on you. You know, but it's not about the literal food. But that also, again, doesn't come to a thing where now I'll just, no, I don't care about Shabbat because everyone else will bring lack of stuff. You, it's a spirit of excellence, but it must come from a motive of service to Yahweh. But when we understand what we're doing and we partake of a meal together, etc., at Pesach, on Shabbat, at the feast, it's a celebration of Yahweh's presence. It's not about the, the, the literal things. And that's what Aharon began to see because he might have thought, oh, I'm hungry, let me have this anyway, you know. But now understanding the provision of our master and the thanks that we ought to have. And that's why we give thanks to our master for everything. And that's why when we do that, he becomes set apart in our eyes. Then we are able to bring him the pro proper esteem as sons and daughters are to bring to our Heavenly Father. Anybody want to share their thoughts before we look at what is to be eaten and what's not to be eaten? Jan's been ready in the hot seat there for a while. Okay, Jan, chapter 11. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe and to Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the living creatures which you do eat among the beasts that are on the earth. Whatever has a split hoof completely divided, chewing the gut among the beasts that you do eat. Only these you do not eat among those that chew the gut, of those who have a split hoof, the camel, because it chews the gut, but does not have a split hoof, it is unclean to you. And the rabbit, because it chews the gut, but does not have a split hoof, it is unclean to you. And the hare, because it does it, because it chews the gut and does not have a split hoof, it is unclean to you. And the pig, though it has a split hoof completely divided, yet does not chew the gut, it is unclean to you. Their flesh you do not eat, and their carcasses you do not touch. They are unclean to you. These you do eat of all that are on the, in the waters. Only one that has fins and scales in the waters, in the seas or in the rivers, that you do eat. But all that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers, all that move in the waters, or any living being which is in the waters, they are an abomination to you. They are an abomination to you of their flesh you do not eat, of their carcasses you abominate. All that have not fins or scales in the waters are an abomination to you, and these you do abominate among the birds. They are not eaten, they are an abomination, the eagle, the vulture, and the black vulture, and the hawk and the falcon after its kind, every raven after its kind, and the ostrich, and the night hawk, and the seagull, and the hawk after its kind, and the little owl, and the fisher owl, and the great owl, and the white owl, and the pelican, and the curion vulture, carrion vulture, and the stork, the heron of this kind, and the hoopy, and the bat. All flying insects that creep on all fours is an abomination to you. Only these you do eat of every flying insect that creeps on all fours. Those which have joined, the, which have joined legs above their feet, which 
with which they live on the earth. These of, of them you do eat. The Alba locust of its kind, and the Solemn locust of its kind, and the Goggle locust of its kind, and the Chacha locust of its kind. Chacha. <laughs> 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 I know you look at locusts, you think I was eating that. Chacha. <laughs> <laughs> But all other flying insects, which have four feet, are an abomination to you. And by these you are made unclean. Anyone touching the carcass of any of them is unclean until evening. And anyone picking up parts of the carcass or even or any of them has to wash his garments and shall be unclean until evening. Every beast that has a split hoof, not completely divided, or does not chew the cut, is unclean to you. Anyone who touches their carcasses is unclean. And whatever goes on its paws, among all the creatures that go on all fours, those are unclean to you. Anyone who touches their carcasses is unclean until evening. And, who, and he who picks up their carcasses has to wash his garments and shall be unclean until evening. They are unclean to you. And these are unclean to you among the creeping creatures that creep on the earth, the mole and the mice and the mouse and the tortoise of the each kind and the gecko, and the land crocodile, and the sea reptile, and the sand lizard, and the chameleon. These are unclean to you among all that creeps. Anyone who touches them when they are dead becomes unclean until evening. And whatever any of them in its dead state falls upon becomes unclean, whether it is any wooden object or garment or skin or sack, any object in which work is done. It is put in water, and it shall be unclean until evening, then it shall be clean. Any earthen vessel into which any of them falls, whether is it whether whatever is in it becomes unclean, and you break it. Any of the food which might be eaten on which water comes becomes unclean, and any drink which th might be drunk from it becomes unclean, and on what if any of these carcasses falls, becomes unclean. An oven of cooking range, an oven or cooking range, it is broken down. They are unclean and are unclean to you. But a fountain or a well, a collection of water is clean. But whatever touches their carcasses is unclean. And when any of these carcasses fall on any planting seed which is to be sown, it is clean. But when any water is put on the seed, and any part of any such carcass falls on it, it is unclean to you. And when any of the beasts which are full for food dies, he who touches its carcass becomes unclean until evening. And he who eats of its carcass has to wash his garment and shall be unclean until evening. And he who picks up its carcass has to wash his garment and shall be unclean until evening. And every swarming creature the one that swarms on the earth is an abomination, it is not eaten. Whatever crawls on its stomach, and whatever goes on all fours, and whatever has many feet among all swarming creatures, the ones swarming on the earth, these you do not eat, for they are abomination. Do not make yourself abominable with any swarming creature, the ones swarming, and do not make yourself unclean with them, lest you be defiled by them. For I am Yahweh your Elohim, and you shall set yourself apart. And you shall be set apart, for I am set apart. And do not defile yourself with any swarming creature, the one creeping on the earth. For I am Yahweh, who is bringing you up out of the land of Mitzrayim, to be your Elohim. And you shall be set apart, for I am set apart. This is the Torah of the beast and the birds and every living being, the creeping creatures in the water and of every being that swarms on the earth. To make a distinction between the unclean and the clean, and between the living creatures that are eaten, that is eaten and the living creatures that is not eaten. Okay, so this chapter defines very clearly for us, along with Devarim 14, what is food. So in the Torah we have two witnesses, Baikra 11 and Devarim 14, of what is food and what is not food, you know. And so they're important chapters for us because we all came from systems where we didn't know that we would doing and eating things that we shouldn't be eating. And this clear instruction given to the priests um, after the instruction 
not to drink so that they can distinguish between the clean and the unclean. Then we get this chapter, because it really is, it's about even our diet. Yahweh is concerned about how we draw near to Him and how we are to also make sure that what we're putting into our bodies is distinctively set apart and distinguish between what should and shouldn't be taken in. You know, sadly, westernized cultures through false teachings ha has clearly made it obvious that they're unable to distinguish between the set apart and the profane, the clean and the unclean. Because if they accept whatever you can to eat anything you will, then your distinction has gone out. Because at the end of this chapter, this is the Torah of the beasts and the birds, so that you make a distinction. So if how do you trust somebody that's eating pig to tell you how to live according to the word? Mm. Because they can't. Because here's the standard. You know, when you hear the, the saying, you are what you eat, it's kind of like true. <laughs> so if you're going to eat that which you shouldn't eat, you're never going to be able to tell somebody what they shouldn't be doing because they're doing it wrong. Because you, you actually don't have the right discernment to do so. You know? All too often we've, we've been taught that since Messiah came, you know, we are free to eat whatever we wish. You know? And we're not bound by dietary laws of Scripture. That's just a lie from the whore. Mm. You know, the, one of the ways that the Jews in history were called on to prove that they were converting to Christianity, and it's a process of, uh, called Hellenization, which means to make one Greek, was to force them to eat pork. You know? So when you see the term Hellenists in Scripture, it's Yehudim that were made Greeks. And part of that process was to make them eat pork, to become a Greek. When did that happen? Already in the time of Messiah. We see it in Scripture. In that time. Yes. You know, and so it, it also became a tradition of man in false worship to eat ham on Easter or Astarte or Sibyl or commonly known as Easter, you know, to celebrate the triumph of their anointed one over Jewish ways. Because it's the abomination that lays waste. I mean, many centuries before, even when the Maccabees stood up against the Greeks, that's already long before Messiah came, they were already trying to Greekify or Hellenize when you say the Jews or the Yehudim, it's because Israel had already been scattered. You've got to understand that. So the only house that was still in service of a temple was the house of Judah or the Yehudim. Now, obviously called among, in, well, there was no J, but then the Jews, for better word. So the way to now Hellenize them and make them Greek, because the Greeks were the ruling kind of nation of the time, was to now let them eat pork. And put pork on the slaughter place in the temple and defile it, which they did do. And a year later, that's when the Maccabees took back the temple and had a dedication of the temple. You know, any time a temple was, any time the temple was set up or tabernacle and the slaughter place was set up and set apart, it would be dedicated to Yahweh. We see in the time of Ezra where they dedicated the temple. We see the time of Yoshiahu where he made a dedication. So it's not when we come to Chanukah as a celebration by the Yehudim, okay, it's a man made feast. It's not Yahweh's appointed time. Because there were many times, we know the history, and it was a great victory, but it was not a command. Josephus, uh, Maccabeus had no authority to instruct everyone to keep a feast that Yahweh never commanded to keep. So we have the history of a great victory and we give thanks to Yahweh for his victories that he gives. But I'm just mentioning that, but that's when already the Hellenization process was trying to be enforced. Well, sorry, Yochanan Maccabee, not Josephus. Josephus, were a couple, he was a historian a few centuries later, but it was Yochanan Maccabeus. Okay, the father. Have, I mean, you have to yes. dedicate the, say, the, the and temple. Just to highlight, you can go and read my article on Hanukkah, Truth or Tradition, based on the concept of what's taught and even taken and adopted by many Torah observant followers of Messiah today, where they want to take in a, a, what they think is bring in that celebration, that Jewish flavor, so to speak. And when it's done in the eighth month, 
okay because Jacobus <laughs> or no sorry Yochanan not Jacobus Yochanan Maccabeus <laughs> getting all mixed up here getting in the Afrikaans there yeah? and when he instructed to perform the feast in the eighth month like the seventh month is because the temple had been defiled in the seventh month they were unable to keep Sukkot so perform the feast for eight days like the Feast of Sukkot, they had a dedication, they had almost like a late Sukkot in the eighth month, but he never changed Sukkot to be now celebrated in the eighth month and call it Hanukkah for two days or for a week. Mm. It was a celebration of the dedication, but they had now missed the, the, the ability to have Sukkot the right way and perform all the offerings that should have been done on the slaughter place for the seven days. And so we understand that that instruction that he gave was, and we should remember this, it wasn't, now this is an instituted feast. So we can always remember the victories that Yahweh gives us. And I'm just mentioning this because we're looking at the process of when pork was trying to be enforced as one of the things that were not commanded to eat and now being forced upon by a Greek westernized culture and how centuries later this has become an acceptable norm through traditions that have been handed down in falsehood mm. to the point where you open one door of uncleanness, then everything creeps in, literally. Mm. You know? <laughs> well, the worst is that the Jews today say you can eat pork if, you, if it's life-threatening. Yeah. I mean, what, what would be the point then? Yeah. What were we looking at the other day? There was something that we... Oh, the blood. Yes. And the unclean, you can eat anything unclean if your life is dependent yes. on it. Yes. Yeah, no, the, the, one of the, the halachas mm -hmm. from the Talmud or from the sayings of the rabbis, mm -hmm. they've, they've made it clear that um, if you have a feeding tube because you can't feed yourself, then you can get unclean things through that to help your body for life-threatening things. Because you're, not eating. because you're not eating it yourself. It's going through a feeding tube. Oh. So you can take pork, you can take crayfish, anything that will help you according to their, their commands. Commands of men that have set aside, or traditions of man that have set aside the commands of Elohim. Now, many will, many will say, but didn't he declare all foods clean? How many of you have heard people tell you that? Yes. You know, like they say it like they know what scripture says. You know, as if like they read one verse somewhere. But didn't he say that, you know? No, he didn't. Now, where you get that is from false translations. Because it, he says in Marcos or Mark 7, verse 18 to 19, it says, Whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him because it does not go into his heart but into his stomach and is eliminated. And this was a translation that then put in italics. Thus he declared all foods clean. It's nowhere in the Greek text. Nowhere at all. You know, the Greek translated correctly, actually says, because it does not enter his heart, but into his stomach and goes out into the toilet, purging all foods. In other words, what you put in your mouth goes into your stomach, goes out by the toilet, all done. It doesn't defile you. What was the argument here? Why did he have to say that? Because when his taught ones were walking through the grain fields on the Sabbath and they picked heads of grain and they ate, and then they moaned at them that your taught ones are eating without washing their hands according to the tradition of the elders. And they have this tradition where you've got to pour the water on this hand, then on that hand, then on, I don't know how many times you've got to do it before you're allowed to eat. Well, it is a good habit to wash your yes. hands before you eat. Yes. It, you know what? It's, it is a good practice to make sure that you eat with clean hands. That's hygiene practices. What he was saying is this defilement meant a defilement of being able to come into the temple as clean or unclean mm -hmm. and so Yeshua says you've got it all wrong it's you know and they were debating now the command to wash their hands it wasn't about what they were eating it was about they aren't keeping the traditions of the elders to wash their hands before eating Maybe. the debate over what they were eating was not a debate mm. in fact there was no debate over whether it was food or not food because they wouldn't eat what is not food. They were taking grain, <laughs> you know. And the Greek word for purging is katharizo, which, from which we get the English word katharsis, which means a cleaning out. 
you know. In other words, your body naturally has a process of cleaning itself out. And catharsis can mean cleansing. But it does not fit the grammatical context to say that they are becoming defiled because they ate with dirty hands. Not, I mean, they, I'm not sure, you know, they, it was their accusation that they had dirty hands. We, that's why we say it's good to wash your hands before a meal. But their process, even if they had washed their hands, if they hadn't done it according to their tradition of prescribed manner of washing, left, right, left, right, however it is, seven times, then, uh, you know, according to them. The whole phrase, thus he declared, is nowhere in the Greek text, in any Greek text, you know. If he did mean to contradict Yahweh's earlier instruction, then he was, by his own measure, someone of very little consequence. Mark, or Matthew 5 verse 19 says, Whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches men so, shall be called least in the reign of the heavens. But whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the reign of the heavens. But then it goes on to say, you know, unless your righteousness exceeds those of the Pharisees, you will not enter into the reign. Mm -hmm. So it's not, a lot of people think, oh yeah, but I'll just be least anyway, so it's okay. No, read on. If your righteousness doesn't exceed the scribes and the Pharisees, why? Because the scribes and the Pharisees, when they sit in the seat of Moshe, they read the Torah, but then they teach you to do their own commands. So their righteousness is not righteousness. Mm -hmm. So your righteousness exceeds their righteousness because you actually do what the word says. And you don't deviate from it, you know. Yeshiyahu 65 and 66 are chapters of that which is still to come. It hasn't been fulfilled yet. And in Yeshiyahu 65 verse 4, Yahweh still considers eating swine abominable. It says, it talks about the wrong ones. He says, they sit among the graves. Now, who wants to sit in the graveyard eating? <laughs> Spend the night in secret places who eat flesh of pigs and the broth of unclean meats is in their pots. And in Yeshiyahu 66 verse 17 it says, Those who set themselves apart and cleanse themselves at the gardens after one in their midst, eating the flesh of pigs and the abomination and the mouse are snatched away together, declares Yahweh. In other words, they're snatched away for judgment. So there are people who are setting themselves apart, not according to Yahweh's set-apart standard, by having pig meals and celebrations of Easter. I'm using the example, you know, have the, the Sunday ham. Come on, we're setting ourselves apart. We, you know, to one in the garden. Now, that's Yahweh rebuking them because he's saying, you're assuming that you're coming to me, but it's not to me. Because when Yahweh walked in the garden with Adam before he sinned, that's the presence of the Creator. So there are people who are setting themselves apart, not according to his standard, thinking they are coming to the one in the garden, eating the mouse and eating the pig, eating whatever's abominable, and Yahweh says they're going to be snatched away to judgment. You don't have to sit in a graveyard. No. Sit among the graves. No. Yeah. Lots of churches are built. Most, a lot of traditional churches are actually built on graveyard sites. You walk over the graves or the, the tombs. In fact, the, the Vatican, um, Vaticanus, is the, is the Latin word for hill of the dead because um, it was built on top of the catacombs. So all the dead bones and bodies are all buried there. So, and it goes against the Torah, totally against the Torah. What we were looking at now as well, the Torah represents life and there shouldn't be a dead uh, in the temple, that's for certain, you know. And so we're going to look after lunch at Acts 10, you know, because a lot of people want to say, didn't Kepha, you know, didn't he, wasn't he told to, to eat unclean? Yes, he was commanded because it was a test for him. Mm. You must remember it was around 12 o'clock, the ninth hour. It was lunchtime. He's hungry. He's at the top. He's meditating. He gets so hungry. Have you ever been so hungry you feel a bit faint? So Kepha's like, you know, I don't know why he couldn't go make his own sandwich, but he was like sitting on the roof there and he's, oh, I'm hungry. And Yahweh speaks to his senses and he goes in a trance, maybe because he's lightheaded from not having eaten, you know, whatever. And in this trance, in this state, Yahweh then says, rise up and eat. No, but I've never eaten anything unclean. Mm. And we'll follow that story after lunch and just see what exactly Yahweh is saying, you know, where we realize what our master's telling us when we are to be eating what he prescribes and the things that we can learn 
from what we are to eat teaches us a valuable lesson about the animals that are prescribed as being food for us versus that which is not. For instance, an animal that has a split hoof and chews the cud, we can eat. A pig has a split hoof, but it doesn't chew the cud. It eats anything. It'll even eat tumors off other pigs. It'll eat human flesh. It'll eat everything, you know. And pigs don't have sweat glands, so that's why they just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, I want to make it sound gross to you, because it must be. You know, and so we also understand that even they've, I mean, you, many people can get scientific factors behind why you shouldn't eat pork. You can burn pork to its blackest blackness, and that little worm is still alive in there under a microscope, you know. And even when you show that to people, it doesn't matter whether you need scientific evidence. Because Yahweh said don't eat it, that should be enough. You don't need science to back you when you say you shouldn't eat pork. Oh, tell me why. Because Yahweh said so. That should be as simple. His, his commands are not heavy. You don't have to go, oh, now I have to, where's that scientific review? Oh, I have to tell you what it's going to do. No. Now, um, uh, Vayikra 11, one, one verse. Yeah, there's it. That's why. Anything unclean cannot save your life. No. If Yahweh says it's not good. No. For you. One thing that we also have to understand to eat is to consume. Mm -hmm. So whether you're getting it in an injection or through a feeding tube or whatever, your body's still consuming it. Or cream or <laughs> you know? soap. Yeah, or cream or soap. One thing we also realize be, read, we've learned, I mean, we're, we're thankful right now that ingredients have to be on labels in our country. Some countries it's not law. So we can get to choose what we, products we can use by reading labels. And you need to get, and if you can't read so well, get your, we've got phones these days, you put it on micro, you take a picture, you zoom it up and you can read it. You know, so don't say, oh, I couldn't read it, so I just bought it. Okay, you can't plead that ignorance. Okay, we've got technology to help us. So, and so, it, 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 you know, sometimes you think the shampoo, the toothpaste, your soap, your cleaning, pro whatever it is, that you, you know, you've got to think. That your body is taking that in through your pores. So you must be careful that you're not taking certain things that are from pork or from unclean or shellfish or things that Yahweh says don't consume those. Medicines. Even yeah. medicines. I mean, this is what we're talking about here. More and more we learn more and more to keep watch of the things that we are to have and what we aren't to have. Why? Because when we get disciplined in that manner, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a formula behind that discipline. It causes you to be more disciplined in your set of partners in your walk to Yahweh. Mm. Because if you'll even take serious about what deodorant you use, just as one example, then you will take serious what Yahweh says. Because then you know that I'm doing this because I want to be set apart. And we learn through it, you know. And sometimes we've made a mistake and we see a thing, and then we learn and we change and we make sure that we don't, Continue. That's where I believe when Yahweh says that, you know, in those days, even if you eat poison, it will not affect you. That's not a license to go eat poison. That's not a license to say, oh, he says I'm protected. It doesn't matter. That's the wrong mindset. If you did something before you knew, but now you know, you think, but how long I was doing that? That shows you Yahweh's protection on you. Mm. But you don't use that as a license to be ignorant. You know? So when we also understand the concept of split hoof, it teaches us a valuable lesson when Shaul wrote to Timotheus that you present yourself as a workman approved by Elohim, knowing how to rightly handle the word so that we can distinguish between the set apart and the profane. So we can rightly divide that which is set apart, that which is profane, that which is clean, that which is unclean. So that's where even in what we eat teaches that. Chewing the cud. It's a picture of we know a cow when it chews the cud. It's got four stomachs. It regurgitates. And it eats again, it goes to the next stomach, and it regurgitates, and so it goes through a process of ingesting the grass that it eats, mm. or the hay, or whatever you're giving it. Now, it teaches us a valuable lesson. Meditating is chewing on. In other words, we are renewing our mind so that we chew on and we meditate on. Mm. Now, I'm not telling you to literally regurgitate your food, but you do in a spiritual manner regurgitate what you're reading. Sometimes you'll read it over and over again. How many times have you found yourself, maybe you read a psalm or you read a passage in scripture and you read it and you read it because you know I've got to read and, and you get to the end of the chapter and you go, what did I just read? Mm. How many of you, I mean, I'm, am I the only one? No. 
Uh, you know, there are many times, and you think, let me take a deep breath, concentration on, let me just go read what I've read again, you know? <laughs> because you really got it, otherwise you're not ingesting it properly. And it's not going to give you the nourishment that it should, and it can. You know, so we learn through things like that, you know. We also understand a clear picture of um, a divided hoof gives a concept of being sure-footed. Like goats can go up the side of cliffs with ease because they can balance. You know, the hoof is split for a reason, so it catches one side, and then the other side it can catch, so it can catch kind of any angle. So it teaches us of, about our ability to leap on the heights. You know, when persecution comes, when we are rightly dividing, we can find our stand securely in our master. You know? So a pig, on the other hand, has a cloven hoof. It has a split hoof, but it looks clean on the outside, so to speak, because you first look at it, you haven't seen it eat yet, so you think, oh, that might be permissible. You know? But it will eat anything and cannot pass impurities so if you go out there and you eat any old junk teachings just know that you'll end up becoming a pig that can't pass those impurities they remain in you and they fester unless you get a proper cleaning out by the word of Yahweh you know and we are to learn to make a distinction the Hebrew word for distinction badal um, is a clear picture of separation of distinguishing uh, um, what should be done, what shouldn't be done. I just want to, before we close for lunch, you can look in the notes a bit more, but I always touch on this the last couple of years, and I like to remind you of it, and those that haven't heard, is you, you've heard the concept of kosher, because many of us, we look for, you know, what is kosher and what is mm. not kosher, yeah. you know, and what I have to tell you today might sound offensive to some, but we don't need rabbinic authorities to tell us and we don't need their stamp of approval whether we are able to eat that which they deem acceptable according to their standards or not. Yahweh has given us this chapter to tell us what is clean and what is unclean. You know, the Hebrew word kosher actually is from the... Um, it, in Hebrew, it's actually in the, in the text, it's kasher. And kasher, the verb, the primitive root verb kasher, actually means to be advantageous, proper, suitable, to succeed, be right, or make a right application. That's what it actually means. So what's also quite interesting, nowhere in the Tanakh do you find the Hebrew word kosher or kasher. Nowhere. In, not in the Tanakh, in the Torah. You find it in the Tanakh. Make, make myself right there. Esther 8 verse 5 we see the root word kasher being used. It says, if it pleases the sovereign, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the matter is kasher, is right, before the sovereign, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to bring back the letters to the plot by Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Yehudim who are in the, all the sovereign's palaces. So here we see it's written as vechasher, which means, you know, um, if it, it is right, so if it is advantageous for you, that's what she was asking. So if it's kosher for you, he's asking the king, and I'm putting it in perspective. You know, these were the words that Esther brought before the sovereign, pleading for the Yehudim that were in a death sentence decreed by Haman, which is a picture of Satan and the, and the anti-Messiah. You know, the other two places where we find the root word kasher being used is in Kohelet, because we see that kosher is used three times in Scripture here in, in, in um, Esther, and two times in Kohelet or Ecclesiastes. And the one is in Ecclesiastes ten verse ten. It says, "If an iron tool is blunt, and one does not sharpen the edge, then he needs more strength, and wisdom is an advantageous to make right." In other words, if your sword is blunt, you need more strength to make it work, you know. But wisdom is advantageous to make right. Now think, it, it's, it's a parable in itself, because we need to rightly divide. So if your sword is not sharp, you can't rightly divide. But wisdom will make, will make it right. It's advantageous to make it right. Now, the root word kasher is translated as to make right. And it's written as Hachsher. Now, when, that's why I'm saying you can go into Strong's and you can see the, 
the root word kasher, but hachsher, it's written as, it's in the hifil tense, which is a causative tense. So it's, it's advantageous to cause you to be right. So wisdom is advantageous in making you kosher. Not a rabbi and his stamp. Wisdom. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 6 says, Sow your seed in the morning, and until, until evening do not let your hand rest, since you do not know which prosper, this or that, or whether both, both are like or good. Kasher, the root word kasher is translated as prosper. It's written as yichsha. And it highlights a valuable lesson on the importance of working properly and not being labor, not being lazy. You know? So when we work as we should, according to the clear standards of righteousness, which is to God to do all the commands of Elohim, then you're kosher. I've just listed the three occurrences, the only three occurrences where we see the root word kasher being used, the verb, and which is understood by most today as being pronounced kosher by a pronunciation. Kosher is the, is the Ashkenazi or Yiddish version of kasher. Okay? So kasher is the Hebraic pronunciation, but kosher is the Ashkenazi version. It's just an accent change. You know, and so this primitive root verb from this verb, because Hebrew has root verbs, which we've discussed many times, and from that you get your noun and your pronouns and your adjectives, etc. So from this verb, we get three different nouns that are derived from it. The first root uh, word or noun is koshara, which means prosperity, that is the state of sufficiency or having enough and being in a good state. So please bear with me as I'm highlighting what kosher is today, especially in light of food chapter, that many, many are using the term kosher as only identifying with food, when scripturally that's not the case. This word koshara as a noun is only used once. It's in Tehillah 68 verse 6. It says, Elohim makes a home for the lonely. He brings out into prosperity those who are bound with chains, only the rebellious shall dwell in a dry land. And so here we see in this Tehillah of David, he's rejoicing in the wonderful deliverance that our master brings. And in this psalm, which is believed by many to be a song that was sung at the return of the Ark of Elohim, which we're going to read a bit about today, you know. And when it came from Kiriath Ye'arim, and the song that was sung when they were bringing it back into where David had set a place for it, and here he was singing the song of complete sufficiency, you know. He brings out into kosher those who are bound with chains. In other words, he breaks the injustice of lawlessness. At the return of Yahweh's presence, he brings about that which is advantageous to make you prosper, to make you kosher. Proper rejoicing and praise unto our master is a kosher thing to do. Okay, I'm using the Ashkenazi rendering because that's what we're familiar with, okay? The second noun that's derived from the root word kasher is kishor, which means distaff. Now, it's only used once in scripture, and it's translated as to the distaff. In Mishle 31 verse 19, it says, speaking of a woman of noble character, which is a parable for the bride to our husband, you know, she shall stretch out her hands to the distaff and her hand shall hold the spindle. Now, a distaff is a spindle or a short staff that is used to hold material when it's spun. And it can be a pulley-like device at the bottom of the distaff for turning for that turning momentum. Okay, so she holds her hand on the distaff so that she can spin, thread, thread the garments correctly, you know. And so the Hebrew word that's translated as spindle is pelech, which also means distaff or whirl of a spindle. And it stick, it's a stick that's about 36 inches long, and it's a device that's used to form or spin yarn, taken off the distaff and spun at high speed so that you get this, I mean, I think it's in, in Somerset where Stellenbosch, we saw the one spindle and yeah, being used, the old, not, not, not just these machines being used, but somebody sitting there working it, you know. It's quite something to see. And the image that's given here is a capable wife that's skilled in spinning yarn. In order to control these ancient machines, you had to be very skilled. 
you know. It took skill and effort and it comes from proper training and discipline. So once again, we're able to learn from this that the talents and gifts that our master gives us and what he puts in our hands, when we work it as a workman that's approved before Elohim, we become kosher. We are, we, we, it, it, we are, we are prospering in the works of the talents that he's given us. The, th the third noun that's derived from kasher is kishron, which means skill, success, or advantageous. Now, this noun is used three times. So you notice kasher is used three times. From it, we get three nouns. Okay, two of them are used once. The third one is used three times. So we see the progression here in Scripture. But I'm giving you the fullness of the concept of kosher in Scripture. It's important to understand. In Ecclesiastes 2 verse 21, it says, For a man might labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, yet he leaves his heritage to a man who has not labored for it. That too is futile and a great evil. Okay, so the, I'm mentioning this verse because the word that's translated from Kishon is skill. And so Ecclesiastes 4 verse 4 says, And I saw that all the toil and skill of the work bring envy between man and his neighbor. That too is futile and feeding on wind. Okay, skill again translated. And the third one in Ecclesiastes 5 verse 11, with the increase of goods, there's an increase of those consuming them. What advantage then is to their owners but to look on? It's, here we get the term ad advantage. So now these three passages don't present necessarily the, the concept. But when you, I like what Rachel was saying the other day. She loves Ecclesiastes. And when you read it from the concept of Yahweh's provision, it's a very encouraging book. Many people like to read it from the opposite side and say, oh, it's folly, it's futile, it's folly. That's not what the book's actually highlighting. And you read it from the advantages of being in the master and prospering. You know, So that's the full extent of kasher, koshara, kishor, kishram. That's the full extent in Scripture that I've laid out for you in 15 minutes of what Scripture says is kosher. Well, this is interesting, those three that are futile. Yeah. Uh, when you use your skill yes. for your own gain. Yes. So it's skill for your own gain, it's futile. But your skill is not, it's for the benefit of a, a body, you know. So when we look at these things of what it means to be kosher, I come down to the summary of this. That which is advantageous and right to make you skilled and prosper. That's what kosher means, you know. Which is what food is supposed to do to the body because when you're healthy, you can get up and do your work, the skill of your hands. But when you're feeding your body junk, oh, it's futile, I can't do this work. And you don't prosper because if you don't work, you don't eat. So do you see, kosher is a very important aspect of our lives. And without the wisdom of Elohim and the guarding of his commands, we can never be kosher. So don't let a label make you feel kosher. Let Yahweh's wisdom and the guarding of his commands confirm that you are kosher in him. Amen? Amen. So to end before lunch, you can look at a bit more in the text there on kosher. I want to show you the pictographic for kosher. So you've got a kaf, a shin, and a riyash. The kaf is a picture of a hand. It represents what one does or works. The open hand, it's submission, but it also the present presentation of what's in your hand. The shin is two front teeth. It represents chew or meditate. And also represents the word or speak. The reish is the head of a man, represents the top, the chief, the captain. So here you've got working the word of the head. You know, that's really what it means to be kosher. Our head, our chief, has given us his instructions. And when we work the word of our head, we're kosher. And we'll be kosher when we don't eat pork, because it says don't eat pork, so we obey him. So don't let a rabbi come tell you you can have pork in a tube because it's going to save your life because that's not advantageous to you. And it won't make you prosper. You might think you get something in the flesh, but you're disobeying Yahweh's commands and you're not kosher anymore. Does anybody want to ask any questions or share any thoughts? Or is this just a reminder again? Or is this maybe the first time that you've heard the concept of kosher? Because... When you first come on this walk, a lot, of, a lot of influence can come sometimes. No, you must go to that shop because they sell. I know, they're all kosher. Mm. Just look at what Yahweh says, and Shaul makes it clear. When you go to the marketplace, you buy 
Okay, everything's ours. Yeah. Why are you giving a steam just because it's got a stamp? Because half the kosher stamps today also have a halal stamp. So if it's all about the authority, whose authority is it? It's split here. No, yeah, go back to Yahweh's word and see. What he says is advantageous for you to eat and what is not advantageous for you to eat. And that goes not just with our eating, with everything. Amen? Okay, so we've come to one o'clock. And the good news is, it seems like our Wi-Fi is back on, so I'm going to let our Covenant family know that they can join us after lunch for our second readings. Anybody want to share any thoughts what we've been reading today? I have any questions? No? Be ready for lunch after all that food talk. <laughs> Let's pray. Master Yahweh, we bless you and we thank you for your word that gives us all that we need for life and reverence. Our desire is to continually let you be set apart before our eyes so that we can bring proper esteem to your name, so that we can be made prosperous and successful in all that we do. When we meditate on your Torah day and night, not turning to the left or to the right, we can be kosher. And I thank you, Master Yahweh, that you've given us all that we need to draw near to you in spirit and in truth, to serve you with great joy, to have the ringing sound of joyous praise continually brought from within, deep within the fire that's burning in us, so that we're not bringing strange fire, but we're bringing prescribed fire of your presence, of your worship, of your esteem. We thank you that you equip us in your truth and you continually cleanse us. As Colleen was mentioning from the book in uh, of Shaul's letter to Corinthians, that the refinement of fire, we, we don't want to just be hay that's refined and we find ourselves making it just in or just out. But, but we want to bring that which is refined like gold and silver, the purity and the reflection of royalty and perfection, because your word's given us the ability to do, do that. And you've put in our hands and in our hearts and in our mouths the ability to present you that which is pure, refined, set apart and well-pleasing to you. And may we strive for that as we strive for perfection and pursue set apartness with our all. And we thank you even as we've been discussing your food laws again. We thank you for giving us much wisdom and that we can partake of that which you've given us to partake with thanksgiving with great joy. So thank you for the food that we are about to eat your provision for our lives, and we bless you and praise you in the name of Yahushua, our Messiah. Amen and Amen. Amen.